Hi, welcome to the planning board meeting. I, I don't even know what date it is. March 25th. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, we are starting. I'll have a motion to open the public hearing for the TGA solar special permit application. Second. So moved. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Any abstentions? Okay. So I have a proposal <coughs> for um, process. Last time we did not get through public comment. So and this time we also have changes. So I would like to propose that we have the applicant go through the changes, um, give the public an opportunity to make comments, have the board interact with the changes in the public comment with the applicant and make sure we have a second round of public comment at least before we conclude. Um, is that amenable to board members? Okay. Yes. Okay. yes. All right, so I just want the public to know that I am going to come back to um, whatever uh, initial rounds of comment you have, um, but we'll hear the changes first, um, and then that, and then uh, the board will comment, and then we'll have another shot at it for your final, you know, your wrap-up comments, if it is wrapping up, okay? All right, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Christopher King with uh, Atlantic Design Engineers on behalf of TGA Solar. Um, as um, Madam Chair uh, noted, um, we have uh, revised the plan, uh, listening to some of the feedback at the last hearing, not only from the board, but also the abutters, um, took a good look at um, really the two waiver requests on the table. One is the uh, overhead, um, which we cannot avoid um, for the reasons noted um, at the last hearing, but it would be important to point out again that you know, our section of overhead is very limited due to the fact we're crossing a wetland and a <coughs> gas easement, um, and it's over 800 feet from the uh, budding residences, and some of the existing vegetation to remain around the poles are going to be taller than the poles, which are only 30 to 35 feet tall. And uh, can I just ask sure. a really quick question? Yes, that is a part of the, your conditions from CONCOM, too, just for clarification. Uh, I mean, I don't know that... I'm not sure it's a direct condition, but, um, the, but the intent was to avoid direct impacts. That's what. Okay. Um, thank you. Sure. Um, I would have to check, but I'm not sure that sure. that's a direct condition. Yeah. I just thought it, it came out of your workings with CONCOM in particular. Um, I mean, it, it did. The location of it did. Um, we, you know, located the poles to maximize our, you know, constructible span, if you will, and then maximize the distance to the actual wetland edge. Okay. Um, and then, you know, again, avoiding direct impacts to the wetland itself, uh, which would be required as a traditional, um, you know, underground installation. If you okay. Um, really, the major change before you this evening is up around the Wilson Street side. Um, it was um, uh, reemphasized to us the, important, uh, the importance of the scenic aesthetics of Wilson um, Street being a scenic road. Um, we understand that one of our wa waiver requests is for relief from the 75-foot vegetated buffer. Um, and so what we've done is we've removed the entire um, portion of the panels that was closest to Wilson Street. Um, with a, a, a dense strip of screening we're still proposing on the Wilson Street side of what's remaining of the array, um, including that width, which is roughly 20 feet. Um, the fence will be located roughly over 260 feet from Wilson Street. Um, we are providing 75 feet along the westerly um, lot line for uh, Mr. Chambeau. Um, we've also increased that to 75 feet along his northerly lot line. Um, we've, um, as you know, discussed at the last hearing, um, there was a preference to providing the 75 feet <coughs> Um, and the homeowner would entertain doing plantings or possibly fencing himself. And so we've left, you know, we've removed the alternative screening we previously had up there when we weren't achieving those widths in the area that's roughly, I believe it's 11,000 square feet of the lawn area that is on our property, if you will. We're still planning on doing the reforestation plan there to maximize the effectiveness of that buffer. Um, really speaking to what we thought was one of the board's um, goals was to limit the um, any kind of 
um, disruption to the existing stone wall are, let's call it option A would be, which still remains to utilize the existing cut in the cart path, um, which would not require disturbing the existing wall um, or removal of, uh, removal of vegetation per, per the special permit requirements under the scenic road. Um, we went out and did a field <coughs> visit last Friday um, and really to take a look at the existing wall and what state it was. Are there any other opportunities to relocate the access to provide the 75 foot true around Mr. Shambo's property, therefore eliminating the requirement for the waiver request? And so, uh, Eileen, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'm sorry, Elaine, if you wouldn't mind bringing up the pictures. Um, I have some pictures that um, correlates to the letters that you see on the plans. Um, basically, A, B, C, A being the existing cut path. The next several pictures uh, just show kind of along, the, along that A cut, if you will, where the existing wall you know, remains. You can see it's not really a defined stone wall in the sense that there's a lot of leaf litter, leaf litter and earth material, um, but it still is a, a, a distinct land formation, if you will. Um, there are other, so as you move down Wilson Street to the north, the wall actually, you lose that earthen kind of defined shape and it goes into what I'm calling a state of disrepair, if you will. And that's <coughs> all relative to this. This is further down, it actually separates our lot line, northerly lot line with Mr. Cutter's. This is what I would call, you know, a stone wall that's in, in good condition. Um, so. Understanding, you can see there, it's kind of tough, it's at the top. Um, but you can see where you don't have that earthen material. It's, you know, a couple stones here or there, maybe the remnants of a wall. Um, and so there are opportunities where we could relocate the driveway and perhaps hit one of these locations um, if the board, um, you know, deemed that, you know, it's a, it's a balance um, really at that point. And, um, you know, we would certainly be amenable to <coughs> understand that that would require a special permit before the board. Uh, we might need to re uh, remove some vegetation or do some trimming per under the special permit, um, um, you know, but we'd be willing to mitigate that on the plan. It offers up a two to one linear, linear uh, mitigatory ratio. So if we disturb 20 feet of stone wall, to create our entrance, we'd be willing to do uh, 40 feet total, 20 on either side. Um, and so, you know, there's a couple different areas trying to save some of the major trees, if you will, within the right of way. And, you know, B is a defined corridor uh, between the two flags on the trees. I don't know if anyone had an opportunity to look after I was out there last Friday. C is a longer area. I think it's roughly like 30 to 35 feet wide where there are spots, you know, there are some trees here and there, smaller caliper. This actually looks, if I'm standing on the road and I'm looking, um, um, Doug and his team um, from the Narragansett tribe when they came out with CLR to do their study identified a formation there. So I'm trying to steer clear of that. So there's only so far to the north I can go before you know, I, you know, I think we could overcome if we're within the 100 foot, but I certainly don't want to get close to the formation because, again, you know, that's another um, uh, important interest that, you know, we've identified earlier in the hearing process. Um, and by removing the number of panels in the Wilson Street, really, you know, um, uh, rolling the dice, for lack of a better term, not fully understanding what's going to go on down on some of the other areas of the site and some of the potential losses it's, that's going to result fr from that as well. Um, so, you know, we're really looking on the board's preference, if you will, as far as whether, you know, the existing cut is, is, is as important. Um, you know, it's, is it more important than the 75 feet all around the resulting width at the property line um, is roughly 20 feet, but that increases significantly. Um, we held geometry that was conducive to the turning movements that um, Chief Slammon requires. Um, and so, um, you know, we feel that this plan with the alternatives and, you know, the work that um, we're willing to provide at the frontage in the event an alternative option is recommended, um, 
you know, we would ask, you know, to, to hear the board's feedback, you know, in regards to the actual location of it. But, um, you know, in one, of, in one instance, scenario A, we've maximized that 75 feet. Again, to the maximum that we could while still providing the turning movements in and out of the site. Um, B and C would certainly alleviate the need for the request for the waiver from the 75 feet, but again, we understand we would need to come before you for a special permit for the stone wall. And so, you know, we would just ask if that's recommended that we work together to identify an area that is best suited. You know, I think there are multiple options out there and then um, just work on and, you know, a, you know, again, our intent is to, to make it look nice at the front. We're still providing a gate. You know, it was really requested by the homeowner to prevent people from driving down and just hanging out, um, you know, making it kind of a nice kind of farm wooden gate at the front, still going underground at front with all of our utilities, uh, screening them um, quite plentiful with some shrubs and um, ensuring that you won't be able to see it from the right of way. Um, and again, we're still maintaining the screening between the field and Wilson Street, understanding that the existing vegetation lacks a little bit understory, trying to beef that up, still going with the black vinyl, um, where the areas that are immediately adjacent to the residents, um, and then still keeping the buffer along the northern edge again as well, and understanding that the topography for Mr. Cutter is a reverse to Mr. Shambo, and so he is more prone to have a little bit more of a visual impact even though he's a little bit further away, understanding the lack of understory. But I know when we were out on one of our initial visits, someone had, I think it was Fran who had hiked way back yeah. to roughly to the edge of the field. Um, and I know that wasn't in the winter, but you know he was pretty well screened there. So um, I think all in all, what we've um, provided is above you know, the alternative. Um, but you know, I think we've done some creative things and um, are um, anxious to hear the board's input. And I just want to um, <clears throat> revise one comment that was made by Mr. King, just with respect to the utility connection being overground at the center of the parcel. I don't believe that formally is a needs a request for a waiver under 210-202-G. The language is all utility connections from the commercial solar photovoltaic installation shall be underground unless otherwise specifically permitted otherwise by the planning board and the special permit. And so the, the, it's not a bylaw that's written that says period, they have to be underground. It, it'll, the, the planning board is allowed to specifically permit uh, what's uh, uh, set forth in the special permit. So, so it's not necessarily actually a request for a waiver. It's, it's a request that you specifically permit what we're, what we're proposing at the center of the property. <clears throat> okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay, so um, at this time we'll take um, some time for public comment so that everybody gets a chance, um, and this won't be your last shot at it, but if anybody did come um, interested in saying something, this is a good time to start. Good evening. Even Madam time. Chairwoman, uh, Planning Board members, thanks so much for your for our opportunity to speak. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Atlantic Design and TJ Solar for the plans that came in on Thursday or Friday. I don't remember when. As much as we have gotten to know you, you have to start with your name address. Tom Shambo, 15 Wilson Street um, in Hopkinton. Um, uh, I don't have to say the other stuff again, though, right? No, you're all set. That was lovely. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I think some, they addressed some really good issues mm -hmm. um, with the mo most recent site plans. I just want to comment on that. Um, removing the set of panels between uh, 15 and 21 Wilson Street and keeping the scenic design um, nature, if you will, of, of uh, Wilson Street, I think is a, is a big thing you know, for us. It was a big conversation for us. I am still um, <coughs> hoping that you could consider um, for the larger animals, a gate in the really narrow part of the property. Um, you know, uh, last two weeks ago, Chris had mentioned deer, how, you know, they're smart and they can go up the trails, but there's turkeys and there's coyotes. <laughs> are you suggesting that turkeys are not <laughs> as smart as deer? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, 5.30, 5.45 in the morning, there's at least one coyote that goes down my driveway heading into the woods. Right, so it's going to funnel them mm -hmm. one way or the other. I just would like to, you know, us to consider that. 
And I still believe we have not heard a good reason why the connection can't be on Cedar Street, which is an industrial zone area. Um, I did have an opportunity to speak with the uh, landowner on um, Lumber Street. It's a 1,600 foot connection from the solar array to the street. This is maybe four or 500 feet, I don't know exactly. Seem, I'm not sure what the issue is as to why the connection can't be there versus Wilson Street. Um, so, you know, from my side, um, those are really, you know, my thoughts from the most recent um, design plans that haven't been met. Um, I did mention that I am looking at some additional screening myself. Yeah. Um, again, after looking at other solar arrays, the one row of trees 10 feet apart, just, gee, I don't know, it doesn't really do anything. So you need two or three rows. I was hoping to keep one row, <laughs> and then I would add the second or the third row. Um, so that could be considered, I would appreciate it. Uh, so I realize it's Josh, a, just to clarify, this is on the property that you have mowed as if it was yours but not yours, or on your property? No, um, and I'm not, uh, with, with the panels gone in between, the northern section, which is the area that I have been mowing, I'm not looking for necessarily, you know, okay. that, that screening okay. to stay. Okay. I'm looking I for gotcha. the westerly part. I got gotcha. you. And it had been suggested to me that the only place that it could be put was on my property. They couldn't put it on their property because it wouldn't do a good job, I guess. But now that it's been moved back, it feels like at least a row of screening could go along that fence, and then I could supplement additional screening on my property uh, or a fence or trees. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Hey, Mary. Good evening, Planning Board. I'm Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road. So I don't live anywhere near Wilson Street. However, I do have some <coughs> comments, and I think I might be more efficient if I just read them rather than try to um, do them haphazardly. So um, once again, the Planning Board is faced with this vote on the solar farm development in the scenic road area of Wilson Street and the Cedar Street neighborhoods. TJ Solar needs waivers from the town zoning bylaws, especially section 210-203D to proceed. The planning board is within its right to vote against this project. So what will you do? Reject and protect or cave and waive? There are some who are concerned that TJ Solar may sue if the project is rejected. Do you think our laws and rights as citizens of Hopkinton should be ignored every time there is a possibility of a lawsuit? Why have laws and bylaws if they aren't used to protect us in our neighborhoods? The big question for me is whether or not this solar farm is a detriment to the neighborhood. Here are some brief comments. Trees generate oxygen for us to breathe and cool the land around them. Solar panels use toxic chemicals in their production. Trees prevent soil erosion and are not harmful <coughs> to the area. Solar farms destroy the trees, erode the soil, and disrupt water flows. Trees reduce air pollution and provide a barrier to wind and storms. Solar farms are potentially hazardous during high winds and storms. Trees provide shelter and protection for precious wildlife and their migration. <coughs> Solar farms destroy the wildlife, shelter, and migration. Trees add monetary value to neighborhoods. Solar farms may reduce the monetary value of neighborhoods when installed on property next to homes or on the outskirts of yards. Trees do not need a disposal plan for toxic chemicals. Solar farms need a long-range plan to dispose of the panels and the toxic chemicals they contain when the panels are damaged or no longer useful. I'm not against solar-generated energy. I think there's plenty of space for solar panels and solar farms, but they do not belong next to homes or near yards of residential neighborhoods. So I ask the Planning Board to vote against this project. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Welcome. Hi, Susan Hanowich. I live at 14 Wilson Street. So I am not, I'm sitting here as just a citizen. I don't have a lawyer beside me. And there's just a couple of things that I, I really kind of don't understand. At the last meeting, um, the developer spent over an hour re-reviewing the plan that all of you or most of you had already voted down. So I was anxious to see now today what they came for a, a, revise, a revision. 
And um, I guess I'm happy that they've uh, decided to take those two rolls of panels out. But I think for over the past six months, you know, we've been asking, what are the consequences if you d take those out? And repeatedly, they said, well, the, the project is not viable without those panels. So now I'm kind of, I'm really at a pause because I wonder, have they given us full disclosure or is something a little amiss because now they're gonna take the panels out? And we've asked that all along. So I guess I'm a little suspect. Um, as far as the Cedar Street connection, I know that's gone back and forth. That's still a very big concern because we are not a commercial street, we're a scenic road. And my property is um, the one across from the solar farm, and although they have come out and spoken with us as neighbors, it was in August when the trees had a lot of foliage on them, and I am concerned that from my house, no matter how much screening they put, we are gonna see the panels. And I think, Mary, you had asked me that last time, too, um, and it's still a concern. So I know that um, you know they have come a little way and I don't know why that is that they've made this concession now at this, at this ninth hour. But I'm really asking all of you, um, you are residents of Hopkinton as I, for those of you that really s did not support the project to continue to not support it. Although they've given us a little bit, and I, like I said, I am questioning why they have it this hour. You know, do I feel comfortable or am I suspect or do I just feel a little uneasy? I do, because it's a big thing for our neighborhood to undertake and undergo. It's a very windy, scenic road, and how is that really, really going to work for all of us? So whatever ramifications or emotions you're feeling right now, whether to vote yes or no, I'm really um, employing you as a resident of the town to continue your vote and vote no, because I think although they have made a few concessions, it's really not enough to push the project through. So thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, just for clarification, what was her address? Fourteen. Cedar Street or Wilson Street? Wilson. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, I'm Matt Zedek, a resident of 16 Wilson Street. And I just passed around some information just for reference points um, because my remarks are particularly focused on <coughs> the nice Hopkinton zoning bylaws that Hopkinton town meeting members have passed over the years, and also the particular zoning um, of the land in question. In the, so on that particular issue to start with, for the residents out there, this is a commercial solar farm proposed between two streets in town, Wilson Street, a designated scenic road, as designated by town meeting, and a state road, Route 85, Cedar Street, which is, so it, again, the land on Wilson Street side is zoned agricultural and residential. And a town meeting member, town meeting about 10 years ago, rezoned a good portion of the land, I believe around 13 acres, on the Cedar Street side as industrial B zoned. That's a big reason why, as a resident and somebody who follows these things, I still have to remain opposed to the project as um, proposed by the developer because the connection of this commercial solar farm project it is still being proposed on a residential street in a residential agricultural zoned area as compared to the commercial, the industrial B zone. It just common sense and everybody I've talked to in town says there's no good reason and we haven't seen a le legitimate reason put in writing by the proponent on why the connection has to take place on Wilson Street. So for that reason alone, we're still a major concern and have to remain opposed to the project. Disappointingly so, we'd like to support something like this. <coughs> now specifically to the um, uh, information I passed out there, and this is based on the good background information that has been provi provi gets provided to the planning board members before your meetings. So I went to the three sections that keep being cited for your consideration in those backup memos and looked for additional 
language in the bylaws that supports um, what I believe the Hop town of Hopkins always strive for, which is balanced growth. We have the right of the private developers to grow, but we also have the rights of the citizens who've lived here and invested in the community. And I really believe our bylaws do that. So I know there's a lot of sections referenced here. I'm just going to try to point out a couple that I really believe are germane to where the project is being proposed at this particular point. The first part of the zoning law that's referenced in your backup materials that I'm referring to here relates to section 210.121.1 which relates to buffers around non-residential uses in residential districts, and that certainly applies here. So two quick things. Uh, in Section A, it talks about how um, the screening has to t is located on the same lot as the non-residential use. So that's just making sure that any screening takes place not on the abutting property. The key part that I want to focus on is uh, Section D relates to what TJA pr is proposing um, that is seeking a waiver. And then in section E, I want to, uh, this has been part of your planning board memos, and I just wanted to point out that all of that language has been in the memo, but only the first sentence is applicable in terms of your deliberations, because in the, the second two, second and third sentences are not applicable to this particular project because the land um, has never been developed. So I just want, that's, that's pretty important because that's been in your planning board backup material, all of that language when actually only one sentence in that particular section is applicable to this project. I know there's been a lot of discussion about buffers and things, so that's why I just wanted to point that out. The second section relates, uh, on the second page, this, tar this is referring to the commercial solar photovoltaic installation part of our bylaw, which is what is being proposed in front of you. I'll just simply jump down to uh, G in the middle of that page, and that's a section related to um, uh, the, inter uh, the electrical interconnections on the project. And I, again, that last sentence says, if it's required by the utility provider, and I, again, I don't believe any information has been submitted showing evidence that the utility provider is requiring that. On to that last section, which relates to, actually, if you can uh, switch over to that next page briefly. Um, this is the key part that's been referenced in your uh, backup materials about the three things that you have, to, the planning board needs to deliberate with, um, uh, for the approval criteria. So again, the second one is what we've certainly always been focusing on. The commercial solar fo photovoltaic installation will not be detrimental to the neighborhood of the town. And we've, you've heard over the testimony over the last hearings, lots of information about that. The third feature is something that hasn't had much attention. Uh, but I believe it's important because it ties in with what the planning board needs to continue to deliberate, and that's the environmental features of the site and surrounding areas are protected, and specifically surrounding areas will be protected from the proposed use by provision of adequate surface water drainage. So I think a lot of people in town think that the Conservation Commission is just in charge of, is in charge of the environmental um, features in town and the resources, but they're very clearly focused on the wetlands in the community and as outlined in this bylaw, it's the planning board's deliberation, uh, part of their deliberation to focus on the other environmental features uh, through the planning process. And then just to wrap up, if I may, uh, the last page relates to the special permit granting authority. Because again, town meeting didn't allow commercial solar farms in town by right. They set it up intentionally so that there was a good check and balances so that the town would have an opportunity to make sure any proposed project wasn't <coughs> detrimental to the neighborhood of the town. So the, I just want to wrap up in conclusion because as the special permit granting authority, I appreciate that the board is following what it says in section H. In reviewing an application for a special permit, the special per permit granting authority shall give due consideration to promoting the public health safety, convenience, and welfare, and shall not permit a use that is injurious, <coughs> noxious, offensive, or detrimental to its neighborhood, except as otherwise specified in this chapter. So again, thank you for your good deliberation, and uh, pre appreciate it very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the, from the public who wants to comment at this time? Sure, Mary. Um, yeah. Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road. I don't know if um, 
the planning board. I was able to give, uh, if everyone wants a copy of this, I was able to pass out some. I can leave, because um, my comments came from this document that I put together. If you'd like, I can leave some more copies for you. And because I, since I read from it, it's entered into the record then, right? Yeah, and you can leave them on the chairs if other public wants to access them because they're new and we're not in the packet. Okay. I did give, to, I think almost everyone here, but. I apologize if my name is not on it, but since I've identified myself, you're well aware of who I am. I have one, Mary, thank you. <clears throat> Can I ask you a question that pops into my head? There was a handwritten note in our packet. Do we know who sent that handwritten note? It's anonymous. It was anonymous. Yeah. Yeah. I heard it. I'm sorry. I forgot to sign it. OK, thank you. Go ahead and sit there. So a member of the audience, Mrs. Ann Zedek, has identified herself as the author of the handwritten note. Thank you very much for that, Ann. What's your address? 39 East Main. 39 East Main. Perfect. I'm like, how did you get it in these, this day and age without like a <laughs> electronic <Marked t>. envelope? <laughs> Thank you, Ann. Um, anybody else from the public at this time? Okay. <clears throat> how about we go around uh, the planning board and see if there are additional comments on the new material or um, in response to any of the public comments? Carol's good. But I have a couple comments. <clears throat> <coughs> Pardon me for my cold. <clears throat> uh, last meeting we talked about a couple of things. One was um, the letters that we got before Christmas. And um, I've got further advice that in the future, if you want to contact a planning board or an official, elected officials, you can send those letters to the town hall or city hall, depending on where you're sending them, not to people's homes. Um, it might be more efficient that way in the future. Um, Getting fan mail, Frank? Is that what you're saying? Because <laughs> I'm not getting fan mail. I just I don't want anybody to think I'm bitter about it, but it's not <laughs> happening for me. <laughs> There's no way I was getting to the uh, post office Christmas week. Um, secondly, uh, I got a chance to speak to many of the neighbors. Um, thank you, and uh, I'm very happy that the 75-foot buffer is, is part of their plans now going forward. Um, but last meeting, we, I asked you about the interconnection, and your response was that the Eversource had said, no, it's um, not their preference because they feel that if there is an outage, it would affect a larger portion of the population if it's on Cedar Street than if it's on Wilson Street. And I thought about that answer after the meeting, and it didn't really make me feel confident in that answer. And then I thought, well, I would like to see whatever source said about this specifically so that we can consider whatever source's position is on this. Um, because we've had other projects in town, Lumber Street near the 110 Grill, where we wanted wires underground. And we were told, oh, Eversource won't allow it. And three months later, they allowed it. Um, so sometimes dealing with Eversource dealing with any utility can be difficult but I would like to see what they actually are saying about this uh, so we can see it in black and white so I'd like to officially request uh, that documentation from Eversource about the interconnect <clears throat> are you all set yes okay Deb um. Again, I want to um, repeat um, to say to Chris that I really appreciate most of my concerns were handled in the latest documentation. Um, I think there's some decisions that need to be made, and I think um, that they presented very fairly the, the approach um, by keeping the neighborhood separate from, from the utility. Um, but I do have some questions. There was an inconsistency that I found in the drawings. Um, and I'm hoping you can clarify it. In the larger, more blown up versions, I can't get into my screen because my computer is sort of having issues. But in the larger plan, um, you're not showing, you're showing the gating connected. Um, 
between um, each one of the sections of the solar farm, but in the, um, wait, in the yeah, overall plan, but in the smaller sections, I, I, I thought I saw the gating separating each distinct solar area. And I just wanted to find, because I thought that that was a brilliant idea and where the, the, the gating would open for each section. Um, and I thought that was very doable for the larger wildlife. So it would address some of the concerns in that respect. Is that the case? There's two different versions. On the large version, you're not showing the fencing. You're showing the fencing all connected. But in the smaller, more close-up version, you're showing it separated. Did I, did I see something wrong? Oh, you have you actually have to come up here, Chris. Thank you. Currently, the only breaks in the in the array with gates are at the gas pipeline. Uh, Maybe um, a line type scale issue between the larger scale and the, the blown up scale, um, but this does not currently have a break. In the array, I think you're talking I about. I thought I saw specifically, and, I, and, it, and, and if I did see an error, um, so, okay. um, the big one, or yeah, the big one, I did not, I, I didn't see the break, okay. Yeah. But then when we get to the smaller scale, I oh, I guess, oh, I see, I didn't, okay, so I haven't seen the drawings in the smaller scale, so sure, my sure. computer yeah, screen, yeah. but just throwing it out there. You know, we're putting a couple gates in there. I'm just wondering if that's a possibility so that that would quell that, that problem. Concern, that sure. concern, yeah. That's the wildlife corridor. That's the wildlife corridor, yeah. Okay. Um, and I, uh, to, to, to further, um, so I would jump on with, with Frank's um, question as well. It'd be nice to have some documentation as to the specific concerns um, of the power of the company, power company, as to why we're, we're putting on one side and not the other. Um, my other question, though, that um, Mary brought up, and, and I'd like to ha find out a little bit more information, is when these panels break in a windstorm, what is the operation? What is the procedure of repair? Where do the noxious gases go, uh, fumes go? Um, and how is that managed? How is the cleanup managed? I don't think we've had any information that's provided that kind of documentation. Um, so typically there, you know, the, if a panel breaks, it's, um, you know, the grid is set up so that the operator is notified of a, an ill-performing string, if you will, um, and they'll go in and our long-term, our, our facility operation and maintenance plan has the protocol basically for replacing panels certainly if they're broken um, but also if they're underperforming um, which happens every now and then but the life of these panels is you know 20 plus years typically um, there are, you know not, there aren't any hazards um, associated with the panels themselves in the event that they break um, they're deemed you know, that's why they call it clean energy, if you will. I know there was some reference to, you know, toxin production, um, but, you know, the, the Clean Energy Center, which is the, the state entity that is promoting the, the clean energy and solar being clean energy by definition, um, you know, they have studies also out there that talk about the offset as far as the impact to the carbon footprint. And based on the average household energy consumption in the Northeast, they come up with a actual, you know, carbon footprint, if you will. Um, and there are multiple variables. One of the largest ones would be the ability of a forest to offset that. And one of the variables that you consider is the robustness of the, of the, of the forest, not only the mature trees, but also the understory with the idea of full forest top to bottom would off would you know do more good to the carbon footprint if you will and so you know the math you know there are studies out there and the math proves that a solar project you know actually um, does you know more good as far as offsetting the carbon footprint by a factor of anywhere from 20 to 40 to 1 depending on 
the type of forest that you would consider. So, um, so those so, are the statistics from where? Uh, the Cl uh, Clean Energy Center and there are a couple other New England states that have produced um, data that, that it, it basically equates the average household carbon footprint, um, equates that to the actual facilities generation and that basically says okay. Is there a formula that we can take the square area of this property and to the, the clear cutting and the, the changes that are going to be happening. And can we find what that footprint and the effect of that footprint is? Is there a formula for something? There's like no that? direct formula per se. Like I was explaining, there are a number of different variables, but there are certainly conservative guidelines or rule of thumbs that you can follow that, again, the information is made available through the state. Um, and when you do the math, um, on just a conservative le level, the math demonstrates that a solar farm, because it's taking, it's providing clean energy, it's taking away the need to burn traditional fossil fuel energy, and so it actually is offsetting the carbon footprint more than the actual existing forest would be. Now, there's no direct formula, um, but again, there is, there are numerous studies out there with the data that strongly suggests that the ratio offset, again, there are a number of different variables, but um, we've done it on a couple different projects and it's been anywhere from 20 to 40 to one ratio as far as Oh, you as have done it on other projects? Yeah, as, as far as a reduction in carbon. Do you have sa maybe samples of that work that we could, s could take a look at? Um, um, I mean, I don't have anything on me this evening. Um, I mean, I think that would that would answer Mary's question. the the other The other thing is um, sort of to um, answer, to talk to towards Matt's question about the um, the water drainage and the flow. Is that going to be substantially interrupted? I know we've, we're protecting the wetlands, and I know we're building on the higher um, plateaus. What would would you have it? But how much actual um, destruction are we, just, are, I'm just saying, how much change are we going to be making on the rocks and, and the, the, the surface, the land surface, to, to, to attach the panels? Sure. Um, I mean, we're going to be basically clearing and grubbing to allow for the installation of the panels. These um, types of projects typically try to mimic existing contours. There are some areas that are a little steep here um, where we're, you know, proposing, you know, an adjustment, but it's, it's not a, a large earthwork operation. Um, and, you know, the stormwater itself, as far as water runoff and characteristics, you know, this was reviewed by Phil Paradis um, with Beta, okay. and our stormwater design conforms to the, the requirement to ensure that we're not causing downstream flooding or detriment due to in any increase in stormwater. Okay. So. so I guess my only, my only question, um, and, and again, thank you for complying um, those two panels um, up front, I think, um, were dubiously positioned in, in, in the um, homeowner's view. Um, but I do, do still want to try to address some of the fencing um, because I guess what I had seen on the plans, I guess maybe it was, I was wishing, <laughs> wishing that that had been the case, and I'm just wondering if that's something you could look at and get back to us on. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Um, so yes, I would like to also say thank you for um, working with the buffers. I think that's a, a really positive change. Um, just. The, the access way will be paved, correct? Uh, correct, for the first roughly 80 feet uh, per utility requirements. Thank you. So um, my personal opinion is I don't like the A option because I'd like to see no waiver for the, the buffer area. Um, and ha having the choice between B or C, I think B makes more sense to me just from a point of view of less pavement. So, um, but I, I think there's good things being worked out there. Uh, my second. Hey, can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. I don't mean to take. No, no, time. no. That's okay. Um, so option A would leave the existing entrance and not require a scenic road 
permit change. Is that correct? Correct. And it, it maintains or it, it includes a 75 foot buffer except for right at the entrance well. Correct. I just wanted to. So we yeah. still need the waiver for yep, that. Yep. 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 But uh, um, as far as, you know, I think option B had a very minimal stone wall, kind of very rough, if you loosely call it a stone wall. So I'd be amenable to um, agreeing to that in the future if you guys needed to cut through that. Um, so <coughs> great work on the buffer area, but um, what I didn't see any progress on is the uh, underground utilities. So um, I'm not sure if you're aware of it or not, but we currently have a downtown project that will be occurring this year. And it will be um, moving the utilities underground for a section of town that's probably a half mile long. And we're paying many millions of dollars to move that, those utilities underground. And um, our strategy has kind of been not to create any new utility poles anywhere in the town because technically everything should be underground. Um, it probably won't happen in my lifetime, but maybe someday Hopkinton will have no utility poles, right? I mean, that would be the ultimate goal. Um, so I just didn't like the fact that we're still having above ground utilities. I mean, I understand it's in the middle of the woods, but um, a utility pole is a utility pole. So that's the, um, I think, like I said in the past, I think you guys have done a great job trying to work with the town and um, work through all these issues, but that was the one stickler that I still have. Brian. Uh, so I will also echo the sentiments of my colleagues in terms of the changes, and thank you for the work, Chris, that you've done on this. Um, a couple questions. Option B in the entrance, Yes. that does give 75-foot buffer then to Mr. Shampoo's properly. Correct. Both B and C would yes, provide right. the 75 feet. That's a question internally that we need to kind of figure out here. Mm -hmm. um, the Wilson Street connection. <coughs> Remind me, because I know you've said it a couple times, it's going underground and connecting to an existing pole on the other side? Correct. Okay, and what will it look like when it goes up the poles? Is it just like a, a line? It's just a riser. So it's a, a line that would run up the pole, um, but it's almost, uh, let's say, half of a pipe cut and, and fixed to the pole to protect the wire. It seems fairly minimal to me. It's an app. I'm sorry, what? It seems fairly minimal to me. Yeah, it's pretty minimal. And during my walk, you know, walking up and down the street, there are some existing residential poles. It's not going to, it's going to probably be less obtrusive than some of the ones that are out there. It would be similar to a residential house connection. Okay. Um, and then the last thing, the waiver on the utility poles in the middle. Uh, I, I think I understand that because you just can't go underground because of the Tennessee gas lines. So the request is to go over the top, right? About 30 feet. And, and the issue is, is that they have an easement that requires their written approval. And it's a significant gas line. And so the only <laughs> reason we're going above it is because of those challenges. And then to mitigate other weapon issues, which, we're, which I think we're already talking about. Makes sense to me you know, across that. Um, and then I think the last one, I think you brought up the little thing for the animals, the fencing. Something so they can get through. Gating. Yeah, that's Gating. For Gating. the, for the yeah. love for the animals that have been accustomed to being able to do that's go Thank forward. you. Go back. So I don't want to repeat what everyone else has said. Um, one thing I was wondering if the town attorney could advise us a little bit more about the definition of detrimental because I think that's a sticking point. Sorry, the definition of what? Sorry, I detrimental. Oh, detrimental. You know, I, I don't really like the idea of cutting down trees to put up solar power, and I, you know, I don't like how that would look, but. Whether or not it's detrimental, I don't know. I don't know if we have a legal definition. We <laughs> have the town attorney with us. <laughs> okay, so the answer is yes and no. Okay. Because um, what is detrimental is largely a subjective um, measure. So that means that you have to decide what is detrimental. And in particular, it's detrimental to the neighborhood, something that is detrimental um, to the property might not be detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, but, you know, the, the, the standard definition of detrimental is that, that if, if the, the harm that it causes is, is more than the benefit that, that is being supplied. Um, the, um, 
not every impact on the neighboring property necessarily um, should be regarded as detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, and, um, uh, but at the end of the day, it's your judgment. Is this a harm that is um, more than just minimal? Is it um, uh, sufficient um, so that it um, <coughs> is something that a reasonable person would base an, would base an opinion on? I guess it would be helpful to know, too, <coughs> Like, w what other uses could go in this area? Because there are a lot of things that could be done that would cut down the trees in this area that might be allowed. I think so we have to keep that in mind. If this project doesn't go through, it, the next thing could be uh, more, de might be, might be more detrimental. I don't know. And that's a tough call. I'm just going to say, in fact, the, the property owner can cut the trees for no, for no reason other than he wants to cut the trees. Right. So I don't like the trees being cut, but I'm not sure. Not our trees, Not our trees sadly. sadly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, that, I, I agree. Think that's all. Um, so, just a couple of comments. One um, to all of the abutters and public that have come out. I applaud you for being vocal. Um, I look at how far this has come since what was initially proposed, um, and I think one of the reasons it's gotten to where it has is because of your engagement. Um, I also think it's important to note that um, the state of Massachusetts, excuse me, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has been um, in, in an advocate for solar and um, they've given us some very clear guidance, even if it's um, through the Attorney General with regards to not being overly restrictive to solar. And so I'd encourage for people that aren't familiar with that to, to look into it, because I think that that does, um, you know, for me at least personally, it, it has some weight on, on what's um, being proposed here uh, and how I will vote on it. Um, I also, again, want to commend the, 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 um, the uh, applicants. Um, I go down the list of, of what they've offered in concession and, you know, whether it be, uh, and, and you can debate as to where things should have started and where they didn't start, but at the end of the day, the utility connection is entirely underground. Um, they've um, allowed to eliminate the, or to eliminate the waiver for buffer, um, which I think is one of the biggest sticking points for us. Um, you know, I think that it's important to note the protection of Native American stone um, formations and artifacts, um, which I think is, is one of the first of its kind in Massachusetts. Um, they've uh, increased the screening requirements. I, I've, I've driven down Alexander. I, I ride my bike past Alexander. I, I know how that looks, and, and I, I think that um, the applicants have, have gone, um, you know, they've, they've gone beyond what's required for them. Um, and at the end of the day, I look at this and I see um, they're, they're willing to make changes to it um, that would address the buffer requirement. The remaining waiver that they're requesting is with regards to an underground, excuse me, an above ground utility uh, in the middle of the property that is preferred by both the utility and by our conservation commission. And, and at the end of the day, aside from that, it appears to me that this, um, this, this, uh, this, this conforms to the bylaws that, that we've written and which the, the state has endorsed. So. There's not so, much. To, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just mindful of the time. Mm -hmm. All right, five minutes or less. Oh, yes. Yeah. We'll come back. Okay. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. So oh. I was just going to say that after Amy and Gary's summations, um, I, I agree with many of both of your points, and I have very little to add. Um, other than the fact that I Googled a formula for trees versus solar panels, and it is available. Um, obviously, you know you need to investigate the source and see see how much credibility and so on but but that type of thing is available to look at online so um, and and I um, I agree with you know the moving of the you know the access road to like the B option seems to be the best option um, uh, you know to to minimize any impact on um, on the abutting properties um, so um, that is, you know, that's all I wanted to say because I, I think that it's already been said very well. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, I'm just calling everybody's attention to the time. We are going to continue this till after we have our next public hearing. We do have a couple continuances following that, so we know we're going to have time. Um, 
and uh, and we will. Um, I I have not sort of said my piece. What I'm kind of hoping to do is um, capture the remaining comments here. Um, also open it up for um, one last shot from the public who's very engaged. Um, Gary, I want to thank you, by the way, for the comment. Um, I think it was a very meaningful comment that this project is better. Um, it may not be what we all dreamed of for that parcel of, um, of property, but it's better because of the public engagement, and um, that is appreciated by this board substantially. Um, so we don't really have time to meaningfully start the sort of the decision making process. Um, so I'm going to ask for a motion to continue this public hearing to f uh, reopen again following to continue to following the conclusion of the public hearing that is scheduled for 730 on the proposed zoning articles. So moved. Second. All discussion. Those is discussion. Um, I'd actually rather continue this. I think that it's been a long process. We have a lot of public that's here specifically for this, and I realize we have another public hearing of which a lot of people want to weigh in, but um, for what it's worth, I, I actually think we should continue and wrap this up. It's a, it's a fair point. My preference would be to continue to after the public hearing, but the motion is on the table to continue this hearing to, to following the public hearing on the zoning articles. A discussion? The, yes, the, we're, in discussion. we're in discussion. Yeah, just want to make sure. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, I think Gary brings up a good point because we're going to change our mindset and for uh, assuming it's another hour, right? 7.30 to 8.30. 7.30 to 8.30. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I would, I would like to suggest continuing the next hearing and moving forward with this one. Okay. So the motion, just to be clear so everybody knows what they're voting, is that we uh, suspend this hearing until the conclusion of the public hearing on the zoning articles. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And all those opposed signify by saying nay. 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 So let's just for. And vote. And there was three nays. Yeah. Three nays. So we're going to continue Appreciate after the zoning articles. But that was, a, it was an excellent point. I appreciate that. Um, we will come back to you for sure tonight. Mm -hmm. Take a break. <clears throat> Why didn't I think of that? Mary, I think he should be chairman next year. That's much easier. Yeah. Why? <laughs> I think Gary should Mary. contemplate the chairmanship next year. Oh. It would serve him right now. I'm <laughs> just <laughs> joking. Joking. So, so um, for process on the um, zoning articles, as we come in, we're a little bit like two minutes early, maybe. Um, I am going to step off the board for the zoning article that um, suggests changing um, the selectmen to select board because I have signed that citizen's petition. Um, oh, and yeah, I, it too. I, 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 yeah. too. I have no idea. This is not the time. <laughs> so Fran will take over um, on that discussion and we'll do that one first. Oh. And I also have to recuse myself from two zoning, two of the citizens' petitions that I signed. So yes. I don't know when we're doing that in so the order. So I've of signed both. I've signed both the, the first two articles that are. Can we, can we quiet down? Hold and it, please. The you know what? Well, let's should I recuse myself? The audience. Hold on. We'll wait. That's a good question. Hold on. All right, everybody, come on in and settle down. Okay. I blame Brian Hart. So we're talking process. I am actually going to entertain a motion to open the public hearing on the zoning articles. So, so moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So for any um, citizen's petition that a member of this board has signed, we have decided that we will step off the board. So I signed the citizen's petition for the language change for the Board of Selectmen designation to select board, as did Deb. Thank you it for reminding me. I didn't know, remember that. Um, so we're going to do that article first, and Fran will take over the discussion, uh, the public hearing portion of that. There are two citizens' petitions um, on the growth moratoriums that uh, have members of the planning board that signed them. They have agreed that they will step off the planning board um, for the discussion on and vote on those articles. 
Um, and we'll take them up next because I believe that that is where most of uh, the attendees are uh, potentially interested in uh, participating in the discussion. Um, and then we will move forward from there for the, the, on the articles that the Zoning Advisory Committee has um, proposed for us. So take it away, Fran. <laughs> All right, so the first one that we're going to address, address here is the change of Board of Selectmen to Select Board, and it's a citizen's petition. Um, I'll open up first to Town Council. I think you, Ray, you rate it, weighed in on that one. Um, if you, maybe you could just kind of recap your, your sure. comments to the, to the board. Sure. So, assuming that the general concept is that you you want to make uh, uh, the language more gender neutral by substituting select board for board of selectmen. Um, I had two comments. One comment was that uh, you, what you want to do is you want to define the term select board to by reference to the charter, charter, of course, uses the word board of selectmen. So you just need to say select board means board of selectmen as defined in the charter. Um, so that, that so that's the Clear. clearest way to, to do that. And then it turns out that the, the, the suggestion was that, that the word selectmen, um, the proposal says the word selectmen should be changed to select board member, and uh, normally that would be a good idea, but in this case it's not such a good idea because um, if you look at the places where the, where the word selectman is used, it appears as though it was used as shorthand for board of selectmen. So rather than change selectmen to select board members, it probably should just say change selectmen to uh, select board just as you're changing board of selectmen to select board. Um, so um, uh, if, the, if the overall intent or the overall opinion is that you want to um, uh, get behind this change, then there's some redrafting that needs to be done. Um, uh, but it's relatively straightforward redrafting that, mm. that, that could be taken care of. Oh, oh, Elaine, I just want to follow the, I just want to understand the procedure here for the citizen type position petitions as we as a board are reviewing them and what is the right process to to go forward. Do we need to address that? Go ahead. Okay. Well, you have a couple of choices. Um, the, um, the easiest for you um, is um, to uh, recommend, to vote to recommend alternative language um, in keeping with it, the recommendations that I've made. Um, and um, the, uh, then it will be up to the, uh, to the citizen petitioners to either accept the alternative language so they can go on the warrant in that form, um, or alternatively, they want to stick with the language that they've got. Um, the uh, it would be incumbent upon the uh, planning board, uh, I guess you as the as the uh, uh, chair uh, vice chair to come to town meeting and uh, offer a uh, uh, an amendment from the floor to substitute. Language. The town council approved language for the for the alternative language. And uh, my guess is is that is that since nothing that we're talking about here is involves a substantive change, it's, I don't want to speak for the citizens group, but the citizens group, if contacted, probably would um, uh, not find any issue. significant issue. Uh, uh, if they do, they, certainly their right to insist on having it put on the warrant way that they want the way it is. Amy. Okay. Could we ask that the citizen petitioner come forward and, ex I think it's and a great discuss idea. whether she agrees with the changes? That's a great idea. Please come forward and state your name and address, please. Hi, I'm Amy Groves, um, 2 College Street, and I am the author of the citizen's petition before us. 
Um, I did notice the town council's um, requested changes, and I have already incorporated them, and I do accept them. Um, there is, um, outside of the boundaries of tonight's discussion, there is a companion um, citizen's petition for the general bylaws, and so I will work with town hall to make sure that any changes to that will be accepted as well <coughs> or, or negotiated. But I have accepted those changes already proposed by town council, and they are incorporated into the handout that was distributed tonight. Cool. Any other background on this petition? Or is it um, just to make sure that everybody understands that this is a wording change. Um, it is a change that I think is worth making because it is accurate. It's um, consistent with our other language, city councilor, firefighter, and such. Um, and it's inclusive. You know, we're saying to everybody, sending the right message that if you're qualified, um, please step up and run for office, serve your community. Um, it's hard enough to get people to run for public office. It's hard work, and the pay is lousy. Um, so we want to make sure that we really cast a nice wide net. Um, we're not really on the cutting edge here. A third of Massachusetts towns have already done this, so we're kind of <laughs> the dragging along. It's, we're just following the general trend. Um, and I think that um, you know, it's, it's part of our history. You know, in 1920, women got the right to vote. In 1974, women started serving on that board. And ever since then, we've been calling them men. So I think that, you know, as a nod to history, I think that we should make that change now, make our own little historical note, and send a message to people 100 years from now when they look at what we're doing, they'll know what we were about, that we'll send a, a legacy to our kids and our grandkids that we can be proud of. Very good. Awesome. Thank you. Have a question? Uh, have members questions. of the board. Uh, Amy? <coughs> good work. Uh, if there were a, a woman who's elected to the select board, and she chooses to be called a select woman or a man, elected to the select board, and he chooses to be called a select man, uh, that would still be uh, colloquial, um, and that wouldn't change if they didn't want that to change individually? So the, what's before us now is actually changing in the bylaws, mm -hmm. so it doesn't address anything about um, public speech or private speech. Um, so it would be outside of the, you know, we already have that and that wouldn't change. So it really would be outside of the corners here. And then the second part of that is uh, this is not a change to the charter. This is a change to our, a section of our bylaws. And then sometime in the future, because we update our bylaws uh, charter every 10 years, uh, the, the charter would then be updated. Yes, and that, is, that actually speaks to the point of timing. Um, it's being proposed right now because it would be easy, an easy change to make right now to the bylaws, and that would give us a lot of time for everybody to get used to the change, so we boil the frog. So uh, you know, at the, the select board, at its discretion, when it feels appropriate, it can change the website. When people need to make new stationery or something like that, they can order new stationery. But it doesn't cost anything, and it gives everybody a chance to get used to it. And then when the regular charter review comes up, everybody's used to it and we don't have to add to the complexity and awfulness of charter review. It'll just kind of slide right through is, is the thinking. All right. All set? We get papers and stuff like that. Nice. Any, uh, anything else? You good? No, thank you. Very thank good. you. Sir? Comments? No good? I'm just going to want to speak in favor of the, and recommending this article. I, I went to the Citizens Planners Training Collaborative Conference um, a week, last week, and I noticed that the pres presenters at that event, they referred to everybody's board of, uh, select board rather than board of selectmen, too, because I think so many towns have changed. That's just become the habit of the, the presenters. So. Good. Awesome. No comment. Okay. I support this fully. Very good. I'll entertain a motion to make oh, wait. public oh, comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Public comment. Mary, <laughs> Mariel, please. I was looking all over the other side. Hi, Muriel Kramer, 39 North Street, speaking as a member of the public, not as a member of the planning board. Um, I just wanted to make the comment, and it, it may seem a little bit um, over the top, but it's not to me. Um, when we talk about uh, making the, the language that we use gender neutral, I want to make sure that we all understand it also opens the door for people who identify not necessarily on the gender binary, and that is an important consideration as well. Um, and uh, you know, gender, however it's, uh, uh, however it's defined, has nothing to do with leadership or ability. Um, so I just want to make sure we're keeping that in mind. Very good. Well stated. All right. Any other public comments? So now I will entertain a motion to, for the language change to, to select board, as noted by uh, town council. So moved. Second. Second. 
All right, we have moved and second discussion. All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, abstain. So passes. Thank you. Was that a, was that a gavel, Fran? Was that a gavel you had down there? Or? <laughs> My pen. <laughs> so, so. Okay, the next, right. the next. Madam Chair, the floor is yours. All right, I just have to reconnoiter here my pigs. So the, um, if everybody is amenable, the citizens who have proposed the petition on the growth moratoriums have a brief um, set of slides to explain their thinking. Um, and then just for everybody's understanding, it's a public hearing process. Um, part and parcel to the public hearing process is that um, whoever is interested in speaking on a proposed zoning change um, is invited to speak. We would ask you to come, when it's that time, we would ask you to come to the table, identify yourself and your address, um, and, uh, and, you know, be heard. Um, I know that these articles have, um, have spurred a lot of conversation, and um, that's not a bad thing at all. Um, I want to make sure um, part of what is important to me as a chairman of, of any board, uh, but also the public hearing process and any issue that is important to um, the town is that um, we take the opportunity for this as a conversation starter and we uh, focus on ways that we have the conversation and we build um, in constructive ways. So um, if you know you are opposed, we, we embrace that and we would like you to come forward with all the reasons and, and, uh, and suggestions. Uh, we just ask that we interact on this topic in a way that moves us all forward in understanding and builds um, a constructive process. So, with that said, we welcome everybody's input, um, and we expect that people uh, came here tonight to participate, um, and we appreciate that. So, the petitioners, if you would like to just give us that quick overview. Ritterbush, 54 Grove Street, speaking as a citizen, not as a member of the planning board. Um, I'm um, um, Deborah Feinbrug, um, 12 Prestwick Drive, um, speaking as a citizen, not a member of the planning board. Okay, so um, Deb and I got together and worked on these two proposals to shape growth uh, because we felt um, that the members of the public were very eager to discuss the growth in the town. So let me just share with the audience that the microphones are not for the audience. They're for the, the viewers at home. So if we need to speak up, we just need to raise our speaking voice, okay. not necessarily into the microphone. So Deb and I got together because we felt that the citizens had spoken to us over the last two years um, expressing the need and desire for the town to do more to shape growth. And we felt that the citizens' petition was really the only way to bring that forward this year. And I think whether or not they pass, people will have gotten a chance to discuss the proposals. So there are two different proposals, and we just had a little comparison chart so people would understand the difference. The one-year growth restriction is only one year. It applies to all new dwelling units, not just large developments. It's more restrictive. It allows no more than 12 dwelling units townwide and no more than two dwelling units per applicant, and it has fewer exemptions. It does exempt alterations and additions <coughs> to homes. And it would not apply, we found out from Towns Council, to the Osmond District. 
Um, the second proposal is a three-year phasing for subdivisions, garden departments, and village housing. It's three years. It applies only to the larger developments. It would not apply to A&R plans. It's less restrictive, and it would allow no more than 10 dwelling building permits in any 12-month um, any period per large development, and it has more exemptions, such as the A&R plans. So this is the text. Um, and it is similar to um, a bylaw passed in 2013 in the town of Northfield, which is a smaller town, and they only allowed for six new dwelling units during their temporary period. The subdivision phasing um, bylaw is similar to a bylaw that Hopkinton had in the past, but which was appealed in 2014. Let's see. In both cases, enlargements, restoration, alteration, and reconstruction of existing dwelling units would be grandfathered and exempt. Let's see. And then in the subdivision phasing, individual building lots, uh, so ANR is not created by a definitive subdivision plan, would be, let's see, they would be exempt. Uh, <coughs> and individual building lots approved prior to the effective date of the article. And then dw obviously dwelling units approved by the 40B would not, would be exempt. So the reason we came up with these ideas was to plan for school capacity, fire and emergency service capacity, traffic, DPW, and highway needs, water and sewer needs, and other municipal services. Um, this is just a chart of the total residential and commercial building permits per year from 1989 to present. You can see we had you know, a large spike in the 90s, and then it leveled off for a while, and then it went up again. Uh, looks like it was around 2014, and it spiked really high in 2016, and now it's down a little bit lower. Um, this is from the fire department. Um, you can see the, the blue is the, the number of responses per year, and you can just see that that keeps going up, the blue, and then the yes to the, yes, I don't fully understand this part, but the yes to the effective response uh, force, is it, that's the orange, and that's also going up, and then the no effective response force is the gray, and that's also going up. Um, this is from the school budget, the school enrollment data, um, and the growth they're experiencing, even just from a couple of months. Uh, let's see. They had an anticipate. They anticipate another 103 new students for 2019-20. Let's see. And then this was the um, last year. They had expected. Let's see. An addition of 50 students from 17-18 to 18-19, and they ended up getting 189 new students, which is 139 more than expected. And for every 20 students, they need an average of 1.4 teachers. So it, it really starts to add up when these projections that we thought would be accurate are not accurate. And these are some of the new home projections. This is in the school budget. And you know, you can never know how many children will be in a new home, but just the more homes you have, the more likelihood of more school children that will need to be educated, and we're running out of space in our schools. So, you know, thank you for your time. We really would welcome your feedback. We know these articles may not be perfect, and we're open to suggestions from the town council and to the planning board and the members of the public and the zoning advising committee. Okay. Thank you. So we'll step aside for now. Uh, you, might, you might not want to step too far, because I'm sure people are going to have um, questions, but we're going to have to sort of shift around. Um, I just want to start by saying, um, that uh, you introduced this as the only way to discuss this this year. And as a member of the planning board, I'm gonna just directly challenge that. Um, I, I never received nor refused any direct um, request to take this up. Um, I certainly agree with you that these are, are key issues that we need to discuss. Um, I also think that for something as complex and important as this, um, it, it needed a deliberative uh, tee up for sure, an approach it needed a lot of stakeholders to be brought into the conversation. Um, I'm not sorry that we're um, we're teeing it up now. I think that this is. I think you're absolutely right that this is a, a complex conversation that this town needs to have. Um, but as owners of the process of the planning board and the ZAC, um, I think it's a it's a, a pretty. Um, reasonable expectation that members of the planning board and members of this act would exercise the, the process as it's designed. Um, I know that there was a quote in the paper that said that um, they wouldn't take up these proposals this year and I, I would really like to challenge that um, and just say that certainly nobody turned anybody down. Um, I also think that there are a lot of ways um, that we can 
we can work with this conversation starter. I am very concerned about um, such a late in the game, big topic um, for annual town meeting. I think that's one of the, the things that is very protective about predictable process that everybody understands and knows how to um, operate within. And I think that, um, that this conversation in the next month and a half is probably more than we can do well. However, we're going to we're going to take our best shot at it. I just wanted to make sure that I said publicly uh, <coughs> for sure and for the record that um, we did not refuse to take up this this topic and certainly appreciate that it's a topic that the planning board um, should be um, at the forefront of. Okay, do you want to start around the, the table? I'll set that aside this time. Sure. Um, so so I echo a lot of uh, our chairwoman's perspective on this, um, and, and I guess just just my question, and in, in, in full disclosure, I've also proposed some similar <coughs> concepts at, at Zach, but I'm, I'm just curious if if this was presented to Zach, and, and what the response was from from Zach. So I can say that I only came to the Zach public hearing and suggested that we look at particularly the agricultural district, which is a lot of open space that could be built for homes and that we should look at how to shape and if that was owned properly. Um, and Mary, Mary's the chair. I mean, of our, our chair of Zach is here. Maybe she can comment on that. Mary Larson Marlowe, 238 Hayden Rose Street. So, um, I guess I'm going to answer as in my role as chairperson of, of Zach. Oh, here you go. Uh, <laughs> does that make sense? How about this? Because I think about, the question I was. A, I have a better idea. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we have another member of the Zach who also serves on the planning board that can speak to that. Um, and I think that that keeps the boundaries sure. clearer for you. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Jump in, Carol. What I had for breakfast. <laughs> um, my recollection is that that yes, it was brought to Zach and it was briefly discussed as an issue that we need to look at um, and that ultimately we will look at, but there was no definitive thing that we were looking at and we had a number of other things that came to Zach for our review. So we, we opted, I guess, to look at the things that came with a little more direction than a, than a wide-ranged statement in the time that we had going into town meeting. Is that and and I would agree with that characterization completely. And it was m more of a timing issue than anything else in terms of what could come before town meeting this year. That um, that this particular topic was not you know was not able to be addressed by Zach this year. Okay. So through the chair, if I could just respond to that. I, again, I this is just my personal opinion here, but I I. I I love where this is headed, but I, I really do think it needs to go through the appropriate processes. And to your point, there wasn't enough time to address this through Zach, um, and that makes me question a little bit whether there's enough whether there's enough time to address that between now and, and town meeting. Yeah, that's to the authors. One of the, one of the things that we did discuss in Zach that when we were looking at articles that we wanted to bring forth to town meeting were the shorter term things and the fact that Zach is now a year round board, so we'll be able to have more time to address these bigger picture things and and really spend the time studying them and coming up with a plan. That's great. Thank you. Want me to go down, Mike? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh. I got confused myself. I'm yes, eager, you're right. Sure. Sure. Um, thank you, Madam Chairperson. I do like the idea of this discussion. I think it's warranted. Um, I do think, uh, similar to Gary, that's probably a little premature. Um, I'd like to see other constituencies involved here, Chamber of Commerce, uh, folks, town officials, stakeholders, in order to really kind of vet this out and look at the impact too. I, I think making a, a call like this would have could potentially have a significant impact, pros and cons. And I think those would need to be vetted out, um, ideally, and kind of work its way through the process before it goes in front of town meeting. I agree with what's been said so far, but I do have, a, for the benefit of the public and just to make sure I understand this properly, um, this is going on the warrant regardless, so we're just figuring out now whether we want to support it or not. That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. <coughs> it's going, so I think, I, I don't know the process, by the way, if the citizens wanted to rescind it. Um, I'd have to look that up. No, but just, we yeah. are not taking it off correct. the warrant. Yes. Correct. Thank you. So, thank you. 
Fortune favors the bold. Uh, Amy, I'm very proud to serve on this board with you. Uh, I remember you first got involved with this board at a meeting very much like this a couple of years ago, and you've been a, a positive influence on this board, and I appreciate the time and effort you put into this, and I appreciate the time and effort you put into this, um, this effort, and I fully support it. Uh, I've been on this board through those years, uh, 2014 and 16, with Fran, and a lot of that growth was maybe from Legacy Farms, uh, but other large projects that have come up, um, some of you got elected on the, the town's growing too fast uh, effort. We hear that a lot, um, and I think it's it's fine time to do something about it. Just try this for one year. It's not a it's not a problem. Uh, it will slow down additional taxes we'll get from additional buildings, but that's this money that we're spending before we even have it in this town, and it, we need a little bit of fiscal restraint, and we need a little bit building restraint. Uh, this board is nine members where we meet, we put in hours reading the packet every two weeks and we meet every two weeks and sometimes more often and sometimes days like today uh, we meet, we've met an hour early and we'll probably meet past 10 again. Uh, we're the speed of the, of the town's growth. We are the <coughs> governor on that. We're the engine that has to review everything as as elected officials that is our job and our duty to for the benefit of the town for what's best for the town and i think that this effort is um for the best interest of the town and, and i think it's high time that we adopt something very much like this if not exactly one of your two plans that you put forward and um I'll be, i will fully be motioning for us to support this yes did i make a comment as planning board member you may. Okay, in not to take words from uh, our council's mouth, but um, one of the points that he made in his letter and that I'd like to mention is the fact that this plan, although admirable, does not give us any sort of direction to take to address the problem. It's, it's a, a one-year or three-year moratorium, but it doesn't actually do anything other than put a delay on for that amount of time, and we really need to look at it and come up with a, a full plan. Yeah, so I, I'd like to sort of piggyback off that and then I'm gonna make sure that I open it up to the public. Um, but I think that um, the piece that drives the conversation is an important, um, a, you know, an important aspect. We need to have some end goal other than just um, not developing for the next year or three years uh, residential units. Um, I've done a lot of thinking about this and um, one small flicker of brilliance. Um, nobody's going to think it's brilliant, but I was pretty pleased with it. Um, I, <laughs> I wonder if there is a way to um, come to some sort of agreement um, with constituency groups that are invested in, um, in this town and uh, from all different angles um, if there's a way to actively study um, growth impacts um, for the next year or the next three years by utilizing something like we use beta for um, engineering consultants by as developments come forward we utilize a, a you know a community planner expert to help us do it because we, we have been talking about this for um, a long time and, and we haven't really found a way forward, but to help us identify what the community impacts um, could reasonably be uh, expected to be and begin to help us formulate ways to negotiate um, agreements as developments come before us that begin to address those impacts in a way that's reasonable and fair and helps the town see the growth as it's happening. But that is, you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Deborah Feinbrook, um, Community um, 12 Prestwick Drive. Um, I, I feel within our research that we've done after we received the council's information, just <coughs> in the two days, three days that we received the packet, we have compiled a survey done from, in 1994 from people that are in this room. So there's been committees that have been formed. The problem is the material's not current. 
So when there's two, actually two surveys, there's a 1994 one, and then there's a 2007. And what's inconsistent, them both. <laughs> what's inconsistent is what they're comparing against each other. So they're almost um, unusable right now. They're not in terms that are relative to each other. So what I would propose in our language, if we write it for the town floor, would be to include a multifaceted community-based study that was done, it was compiled in 1994, which was a wonderful group of people, which are some of the people in this room. And if we could do that again, but bring it up to date and try to use some facts that we know that are current with at least 19, um, 2018, you know, possibly 2020, depending on what kinds of data is available. Um, so that, that's kind of how I was hoping we could address this um, sort of um, short, the short term um, response to the article, either one or three. Okay, thank you. So um, at this point, I invite public um, comment, um, and I expect that we're going to have a lot. Yep. And just as a reminder, come forward. Um, we will, I will in general tr not try to limit people, but we have to be, uh, keep our comments to a reasonable length. Um, introduce yourself, inter uh, state your address, and then uh, share with the board. Mr. Herr. Hi, uh, Brian Herr, 31 Elizabeth Road. Um, not speaking as a select person, but uh, <laughs> as a citizen in town that's familiar with a lot of what's going on, in recent years, I thought Amy had a really interesting slide a few minutes ago, the one with the spike. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we can put that back up. It's on the computer um, right there if you want to go back. That would require some knowledge of this computer. Uh, up or down. Here comes Amy. <laughs> It'll go arrow. Yeah. The, the bar graph or the that right there, yeah. So the spike there, I mean, that's. That doesn't surprise me at all, and as a sort of a student of Hopkinton and its growth for many, many years now, and having served on the planning board a while back, um, you know, the growth is always something we're concerned with. But that spike right there really represents the spike after the recession. During the recession, it was pretty, pretty quiet. A few, pro a few projects, one key project was on the edge of not quite getting going because of the financial crisis all over America. And I think what you're seeing there is that spike where things finally got going again. And we've talked about it at, the, at certain boards in town uh, since then. Um, and I do believe that that drop back to what looks like a more normal level on that graph anyway, I think is how this will carry forward for the next few years. So I share the concern about growth, but I don't think that that spike is a reason why we should change uh, how we do things in Hopkinton. And new growth is critical to the financial aspects and balancing the budget in the town. I'm working on, I think, my 11th budget here for town. And um, if we take new growth out of the picture, it will dramatically reduce it. Now speaking as a selected person. Without, without now speaking as an informed citizen with a lot of experience on a certain board. Um, <laughs> if, we, if we do that, uh, I think we're gonna have a real problem financially. So I would encourage us all to study it further. I totally agree that with the concerns and I share the concerns, but I don't think a quick knee jerk sort of response, not that they w was knee jerk on their part because I know they put a lot of time into it, uh, I think would be, we'd, we'd all be better served. I appreciate that. Can I, I just specifically ask you a question putting you on the spot as somebody who does have a lot of experience that I appreciate. Um, would you invest in that, that study process um, as a as a member of the select board and as as a, a, I an think as a selectman I would, but as a member of the select board, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fair yeah, enough. I, I do think that but it would make I mean? sense it's, for it's us to study. Take sure. A whole a whole team effort. This isn't a planning board effort. This is yeah. a whole team effort to try and understand um, how all the pieces put play together. I can't speak on behalf of my colleagues. Right. They have their own positions and opinions, as we right. all know. But I do think that. Uh, further analysis is warranted before we do anything. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, can I ask one more question? Sure. Mr. Herr? Um, and again, I'm just gonna ask you to speak on your personal perspective as a member of the potentially future select board. Um, this seems like a really big deal 
Um, I think we all agree that there's a, a lot of work to do to make this happen. And I'm, I'm curious if something like this might in the future, I mean, let me go back. I, I'm curious if something like this needs to be dictated by the schedule of town meeting, or if this is a topic that was worthy enough that it could potentially um, warrant a, a, a special town meeting. Um, I'm not can, a big fan of special town meetings because of cost and other Can I just make factors. one process point? I'm sorry. I am aware that we have a uh, uh, majority of select folks in the, in the audience. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, I, I'm just going to say we're going to stick to personal uh, comments totally. Just Personally, I don't like special town meetings. <laughs> uh, I think they're expensive for taxpayers. And uh, I voiced that elsewhere in the community over the years. Uh, I think we can get things done in, in town meeting, but lots of things that come before Hopkinton over the years take one or two or three years to get done. There's a certain set of fields down on Fruit Street that took, I think, three tries. So I wouldn't be surprised if this takes a couple of years to get sorted out. Um, but again, the spike is my concern, and the spike I don't think should be what we sort of legislate around. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Arnott, 51 Teresa Road. Usually when I come to the table, I have my mind made up as to which side of the issue that I'm on, but on this one I do not. I'm sure there's good arguments on both sides. Um, when I first saw this proposal, my question was, how many, do we know how many projects uh, developers have already started the wheels turning on? And the reason I ask that is because this, if this were to go forward, it's certainly gonna catch a lot of those projects by surprise, and I'm sure they're, they're well into the process in many cases. And if that's so, should um, something like this go forward, if they are into the process by going to the different boards, the different commissions, and all the steps they have to go through in Hopkinton, <coughs> could there be some additional grandfathering of those projects? So my question is more precisely, could we get from each commission and each board how many projects have been brought forward to them and what their position is on those projects, and then how many projects in total could possibly be um, set back by such a proposal? And would it be um, prudent to look at presenting something like this but giving some kind of grandfathering or saying we're going to implement this you know, a couple of years down the road when these projects that have already done their homework and have started could be uh, allowed to finish the process. Thank you. Mrs. Wright. So just one point of order. Yes. While well, she's coming up. I just wanna make sure that we focus on our support for the article and not trying to solve the problem. We gotta be careful, you know, cause there's lots of different ways that we can solve this problem, right? So, but that's not the purpose of this meeting. No, I but I think I think that the purpose of this discussion is to see a way forward from with with this this dis, on this discussion point if the articles are not supported. Claire Wright, 28 Hayden Row. Um, I am not speaking as a member of the Board of Selectmen. I like being a selectman, by the way. Um, but um, I, I just wanted to make a couple quick points. I completely. Um, acknowledge that those who are bringing this forward have the very best of intentions um, and I completely concur that as a town this is something that we have been worrying about and struggling with for many many years in the years <coughs> that I served on the planning board and you folks know as well pretty much every article that the planning board decides to bring forward the board has looked at in terms of, very often, in terms of what can we craft that will help address our current growth problems. But nothing the sweeping has come forward before, I think partly because there's always been um, a very realistic acknowledgement that the rights of private property are very strong, the rights to someone using their property, um, if the problem were as easily solved as such a sweeping piece of legislation, uh, we would have figured that out a long time ago. But it's a much harder nut to crack. And um, you can do a moratorium if you've got a study behind it. Um, we have wrestled with this for many years. I'm not saying we shouldn't continue trying, but number one, I don't think it's that easily solved. 
and I have very, very serious concerns about the legal jeopardy that it might put the town in relative to um, existing subdivision approvals, existing permits, and what may be construed by property owners as a taking if they are basically um, not allowed the use of their property. So I, I am worried about the legal ramifications to the town. And I have just one comment on the second part about the village housing. Um, <coughs> this is for you, Madam Chairman. In the um, annual town meeting, May 2nd, 2016, Article 33, the planning board put forth and the town passed amendment to garden apartments in residential districts and village housing in residential districts bylaw. And this bylaw, basically, as I understood it, eliminated both the garden apartment and the village housing bylaw as long as the town stayed within the 10% of our affordable housing, which I believe we still are at. So I'm not quite sure what I'm missing, but I, I think- I, I think I remember not, that too. We are not open for village housing and garden apartments. So that's with regards to the second amendment. The second yes. correct. Second. Correct. This was passed at the 2016 annual town meeting. It was Article 33. And just for fun, I'm gonna I'm gonna just deflect it right to Elaine. <laughs> so no special permit can be issued by the board unless the um, for a garden apartment or village housing unless we fall under the 10 percent affordable housing. Right, and that's still in place. Yes. Um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you tell me that the, um, the the that second one we have already done before? Was there one of them that, that we have already had in place? One, one of the two proposed. Uh, yes. It was a different version of one of those, okay. but it wasn't the same. So it's not the same. Okay. Thank you. So, just a process question: Are we yes. talking about just the First Amendment, or are we talking about both? Well, uh, I think proposals. that we teed up both of the we proposals, both. but okay. we will have to separately vote on okay. them. That's a, I appreciate that clarification. Yes, Mr. Foise. Good evening, Ron Foise, 25 Chamberlain Street. Um, coming here as a representative of the Economic Development Council of the Chamber of Commerce, and <coughs> I, I want to echo a lot of the comments that have already been made, which have to do with the revenue side of the equation. Anything that we do to uh, arbitrarily stop growth without proper consideration of what the negative impacts are going to be of that uh, income is is going to be detrimental to the town in my opinion in addition to that the the economic development council of the chamber is working very hard to elevate the visibility of the town of hoppington as being receptive to commercial and industrial growth which we need to drive tax revenue into this town and I, we we need to thoroughly vet out what a, a petition like this is going to do to the perception of, of the town of Hoppington of, of being negative growth. So I, I, I think that you know, I'm also a, a member of the Zoning Advisory Committee. I think the process is a good process, and I think we, we have to take a, a step back, go through the process, and, and let's, not, let's not hurry to get this through. Let's be deliberate and get it done right. So as a representative for a constituency group that, in my opinion, is, is vital to this conversation, would you support the effort to you know, study it more complexly uh, from all the different stakeholder angles? I think we have to. I mean, we, we all know that out of control growth isn't good, but we have to come up with a solution that balances a lot of different constituencies. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else? Okay. Anybody from the planning board with follow? Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Daniel Haskins, uh, 21 Ash Street. Uh, it seems to me that that um, that the 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 proposal is, as as has been mentioned, thoroughly very broad sweeping, including approval not required, applications and so forth. And um, I don't think that that really is pertinent significantly pertinent to the growth uh, of, this, of this town. I think um, <coughs> when we look at the numbers from Legacy Farms, 1,100 residences, and Madeira, close to 300, 
If those things hadn't happened, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. And what gave muscle to those proposals was 40B. 40B is no longer relevant in our current situation. I think that we are trying to close the door after the horses are already, already out of the barn. I'm galloping wildly. Yeah. Um, so I just want to make sure that I, I say that, um, that Legacy Farms was a very intentional, planned development. Um, and I, I think I agree with you that I think that a lot of what we're seeing um, is a result of that enormous growth. Um, but part and parcel to that growth was um, that economic arm, and it had to be revenue positive. And I think what we're wrestling with now is um, is what what that actually means now that it, that it's in place. Um, as, so as a resident, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm not challenging anybody, but I'm trying to invite people into the conversation if we do have it more completely um, from all angles. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there are, there are strategies and mechanisms that we do not employ often in New England, but perhaps in Hoppington, um, that are more deliberate and specific about planning residential growth or, or any kind of growth. Um, is that a piece of the conversation that makes sense to you and you, you'd like to see, you know, sort of out of the box thinking potentially in this, in this broader discussion? Um, so that we might be, for example, for me, when I think about it, less land consumptive um, and as we, as we develop um, residential clusters, for example. So that would mean rethinking some of the ways that we have zoned for our frontage and access roads and, and things like that. That would give, in some ways, that would give developers more flexibility. But in other ways, it would help us um, be more creative in design um, and allow for, potentially allow for the, the preservation of natural resources and things like that. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big question. It would be very different for Hopkinton. Yeah, I think that the number of available properties is dwindling in, in Hopkinton. There are no more Western nurseries in Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're, you know, these are becoming um, harder and harder to find for very small developers to find a two and three unit subdivision. And um, so they're kind of picking up the scraps that are left. Um, and I think that the town only gets applications for about <coughs> 10 approval not required per year. So you're specific, you're really, you're really talking about the approval not required. And yeah. One, yeah. Not only that, but yeah. I think what I'm saying, I think, is that because of the <coughs> current situation, because of properties that are available, because 40B being satisfied, that the, the issue is already resolved. There's no, there's no practical need. Um, maybe if you're trying to deal with maybe. Anyway, I think what I'm saying is, does it make sense? No. I, yes, I understand you. Did you have something? Just, just as a point of clarification, this proposal excludes A and R's. I understand. That's why so I'm it would not right. be. They would not stop. It excludes them. They're 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 they not be affected. This, is that right? I thought it was just in the second one, no, not the first not one. The second one, or uh, <clears throat> I thought it was both. First. Let's make sure we don't lie to people here. On yeah, I, I agree with that. I didn't see it in the first. That makes sense. Drive. Um, it does. Uh, um, it, the second one um, does not include. Does does include an, um, NARs. A and R's. The second one that we're considering. Let's just get this right now. And that's for the. Um, so the the one year growth restriction does cover A and R's. Yeah. So they would they would be restricted as well. No, it exempts. It so the one year growth restriction exempts A and R's. And the subdivision garden apartment. Um, Phasing includes, includes ANRs. Okay, so I want to, I'm glad to have clarity on that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So it wouldn't be a subdivision garden apartment. Wait. I thought it was and. Mary Jo Wendergan, Chu College Street. 
Madam Chair, I respectfully step forward to give my strong support, to voice my strong support for these proposals. Respectfully, I underscore that this problem has been around for years. I've lived in Hopkinton for 20 years. This problem has been with us for years and until now, nobody has done anything. We need to maintain our top ranked schools. And when residential growth exceeds business growth, we have a budget crunch with the schools. So I hope the people who are opposing this will vote for a tax override so that we can maintain our great schools <coughs> because we need to control growth. When residential growth is too fast, we end up with a school budget crunch. Just, um, I just want to say um, that I'm quite sure that there are pl plenty of people, and I, I don't, I, I agree with much of what you said. Um, plenty of people would argue that, um, that the growth that we have experienced has been part and parcel to funding um, and, and potentiating and making it possible to have this excellent school system. I think for me, in, in, that, in, that, um, in that question, I think that there is a, there's a big area for discussion to understand that completely. Because we, we just finished building a school that is arguably too small to meet the need. Um, and, and I think that we need to, Hopkinton just doesn't follow the formulas that are out there in the state. Um, and that's been the case for a long time as far as how many school children to expect. Um, I fully celebrate school children um, and I have, um, I have personally been advantaged by that excellent school system um, for my children. But I think that we, we could arguably, without having that complex conversation, um, we could arguably negatively impact our tax base and our excellent school system um, by by broad sweeping moratoriums, I just want to I just want to make sure that the way I understand the conversation, it's way more nuanced than stopping residential growth. Um, and I just want to make sure that I'm hoping that we are. I, I appreciate your support um, for the articles. Um, I, I just think that um, it's a really complicated set of questions. Why is it? that when residential growth spikes, we end up with a school budget crunch? It's a really great question, and that might be, um, that might be an argument for um, deeper investment from town government in the conversation, for sure. That's what, how I see it, but yeah, it's, it's a big conversation, Mary Jo. Yes, John. Mr. Catino. Several times we've heard about um, the school growth and the, and the funding to, to take care of the school growth. <coughs> Suppose that we had about 200 new kids start this year, and they've all been absorbed into the system, and the school committee hasn't had to come back to the town and ask for more money. They have efficiencies, and they make it work. We're able to make it all work this year because of the um, the new growth that we had in the town. I believe it's almost near $3 million that we had. You know, granted, the, you know, part of it was, and, that, and part of that spike was because of, um, we did 280 unit apartment units just a couple of years ago. They're all, they're 100% full right now. So we shouldn't be getting too many new students out of that area. But that, that um, complex just sold for $94 million, 93 and change. That, that area that was probably, um, assessed for under a million dollars is now worth well over a hundred million dollars. So, you know, what, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that just the contractual obligations that the school systems have gets, gets into the millions of dollars. So just to meet that, we would absolutely hit, uh, get close to our two and a half percent. So that's why it's, impor it's really important that we step back and be pragmatic and, and do, this, uh, do this the right way. You know, we talked about the um, having it come forward on Zach. I'm also a member of Zach, and what actually came forward on Zach was putting restrictions on the last couple par large parcels of land in Hopkinton. One was the uh, golf course, and the other one was the YMCA. And what came forward to Zach was let's put restrictions on those two parcels of land so people can't build on them. If the golf course was sold, that they wouldn't be able to build them, or the Y was sold, and um, 
at the time, I, it just, uh, I, in my opinion, it was a little too sticky to go into uh, property rights right there with the, and, and going up against uh, two large organizations and, and telling them that uh, we want to immediately put restrictions on you. And I just thought it would look bad. So that, that was the way I looked at it when I was on Zach. But that was, that was the way it came forward on Zach. I don't remember it coming forward any other way. But those are just my points. I, I risk sounding like the contrarian on the board. I just want to make sure that I push back universally. Um, I just want to make sure that um, it, it um, I, I absolutely understand the argument from the other side. Um, and we have had a lot of growth and a lot of growth dollars. Um, and I also hear um, from a lot of um, constituencies, residents, and so forth um, that and we've had underrides, and that's a much that's a much hallowed situation that has happened. Um, but all of our, all of our, our taxpayers are spending way more money. Our tax impact has never been greater. Um, and I think that um, the school committee gets a lot of credit for doing um, doing what they do. But it would be um, there are always efficiencies, but you you can't solve this problem through efficiencies. Um, there are always ways to, um, you know, rethink and, and, uh, and work a little harder. We have an amazing set of engaged educators and administrators that um, value the work that they do. Um, and and we, we benefit from that. But without a doubt, they are absolutely, they are also expressing real time now um, the fears and worries that they are not going to be able to manage. Um, the changing, um, changing population and the increase in school children. So I, again, I just say that I, I'm, not, I'm not openly disagreeing with you, your points directly. I'm just saying it's a very complex and nuanced conversation and a lot of town departments are really feeling um, the pressure despite the fact that we have had a, a great increase in growth dollars. And the taxpayers are feeling the squeaky stretch and are, having, uh, are, are finding it difficult despite having all those <coughs> dollars. So somewhere in there, right, all these competing pressures, somewhere in there is a different way of thinking and, a, and a, potentially a different answer um, to a problem that is very multifaceted. Yeah, if I may, what, you know, we also have to look at the fact that we have a, we have a brand new state-of-the-art DPW facility. We've got a we we have the replacement for the center school, which is also state of the art. We've got a we've got a library that's um, that's fabulous. People are coming from all over the state to look at what we've done to um, reclaim an old building and, and make it uh, contemporary again. So it's not it's not just the schools, but you know the schools are doing a great job. But one of the things that we have to look at as a town is that <coughs> the um, Elmwood School. We're going to have to replace Elmwood School. It has really not much to do with with the, the students as much as it's an old school. So we have to actually step back at some point and say, no, we're going to have to either replace or, or, or redo that one. That's why we just put in for it with the state. You know, it's the same thing with the middle school. So at some point, we are going to have to look at those things just because of just because of age, and as and, and not as much to, to growth. But we that's why we need the growth money. Madam Chair, I thank you for your time. Sorry, to but just yes. a question about the process. We're almost at our time. What, yes. what are our next so, steps here? I mean, we're going to try to vote on hold, this? Hold on one second, Dave. Okay. Yep. I'm going to um, entertain a motion. It is 8.30, which is a scheduled time for our public hearing. Um, I'm going to entertain a motion to open and continue the uh, public hearing on Maspinock Woods, West Elm Street, to April 22nd at a particular time. At 7.30. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? I, I think it's time to s have them come forward with what they need or stop <coughs> because our time is important. There's other projects we have going on as we're talking about. And it's the 7.30 is a pretty valuable time. It's the beginning of our night. And what if they don't show again? Uh, I don't necessarily disagree. Do we have anything else scheduled for that night? We will. Yes. So what I would suggest is that we schedule those folks at 735. 
because we are experiencing that. Um, and then that way we will not be wasting everybody's time. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No. Oh, make what? Extension of time. Oh, uh, okay. So I'll also entertain a proposal to extend the time for the decision until? April 29th. April 29th. So moved. Any, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Nay. Thank you for the reminder. Oh, yep. Yeah. Okay. And Kobe, I voted no on the last one too. Okay, no, I know. Tell me I gave him five minutes, right? I was just going to say, have I broken some? <laughs> it's never a good thing when the attorney is <laughs> whispering to. So, can I go back Are we to okay? my question? On that? Okay. Um, say it again. Can I go back to my question? The process? Yes. You absolutely can go back to your question on process. So um, my feeling is that a lot of people came to uh, participate in this conversation. I don't know if there is anybody else who wants to speak on the growth moratoriums, um, and then we'll move forward from there. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody who came for that gets a chance to speak. Okay. But we're looking to vote on it tonight? Uh, if we can, okay. yeah. I mean, if somebody wanted to not vote on it tonight, they could make that proposal, but okay. I'm looking to vote on it tonight. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Hi, all right, how are you? I am Jen Devlin. I'm at 6 Fry Street, and I'd also like to introduce myself. I am your school committee liaison. Hello. <laughs> Figured I would come up since there was quite a bit of discussion about the schools. Um, and I, I think from our perspective, I think um, the, the nature of this proposal on your plate today, we've been looking at growth for a long time. Um, since um, I've been on the board, we've had uh, an enormous influx of students. Just this year, after we set our budget, we've had 55 new kids join the schools. So if you use the math, 1.4 teachers for each 20, ki each 20 additional students, that's quite a few students. Um, that number has now eaten into our projected 103 for next year. Um, but all that being said, I think you know there is a process in place, and I think following that process is important. And I wouldn't want anyone to push something through that wasn't well thought out. But at the same time, I would love to hear when you when you said one year or two year or three years, I started to not be able to breathe because I feel like one year is maybe realistic and reasonable but if we're acquiring students at a rate of 100 kids a year three years is going to be a little bit too late mm -hmm. because it's not really a new problem mm -hmm. um, even when I sat down with folks thinking about running for this board growth was the first thing everybody mentioned as being the you know of the utmost concern for all the boards in the town so I think um, we really need to, the schools feel it, we absolutely feel it. We are, you know, running out of space for our students. Once we run out of space, we're going to have to increase class sizes. Um, you know, these things are just the realities of what's going on. But I also think, you know, I appreciate, we get a lot of, we get a lot of press, but I think the, the fire department, the police department, the public works, I feel like all of these departments are feeling this crunch. Um, and so, you know, I appreciate all the really complimentary comments of folks from other boards about the school committee. We do, we do make do, but we make do by taking away things that we would have otherwise have liked to do. Um, our general education budget went up by 0.3% this year because we had to hire so many <coughs> teachers and increase the number of buses by the numbers. I, I had, I'd have to look them up. I don't have them from me. But I think that it's, you know, if, if, we're, if you're considering um, not supporting this in town meeting, uh, which I can sort of appreciate both sides, I think the piece that's important is we need a, a pretty vivid image of how we're going to proceed with this and a very strict timeline because I think three years is too late. You know, three years we're already going to have kids in, in um, temporary, you know, classrooms and, and we need to find a solution sooner rather than later. So I, d I do think, you know, I appreciate the need for a process, but I also, on the flip side, think this isn't a new problem. Right. And so if the process already isn't rolling, as it should have been maybe two or three or four years ago, maybe today would be a good day to decide how you're going to get that process rolling. Yes. Um, just, uh, I know you can't answer this now, but I would love to see the in student population or to the um, residential this, versus bike. commercial building permits. Because I, I get that question a lot, and, and I'd, I'd like to see how much growth we have per year, and I'd also like to see 
the number of students that various developments have contributed to our school system. I so, can tell you off at the top of my head, Legacy Farms has already exceeded 300 new students. Yep. I'm, I'm aware of that, but I'd, I just, I'd like to see the trend over time. So yeah, absolutely. For, for future reference, I think that'll, that'll help with at least one of the pieces of the, the puzzle. Absolutely. And one of the slides, I don't want to take too much more time, but one of the slides that um, Ms. Ritterbush had up about um, the number of new units, um, they're all estimates. Can I, do you mind, can I move this? Yeah. Oh, well, listen to me talk. It's not my laptop and not my presentation. May I yeah. <laughs> um, the, um, it's guesses, and, you know, and respectfully, it's guesses. This is a kind of hard slide to read for all of us, including me sitting here. But, um, you know, if we have um, the estimated number of units up for occupancy in June um, is 132. So if just by argument's sake we have 101 child in each of those new houses, that's an additional 132 students joining our school. If there are two students in those houses, we're doing that. Um, and then for um, June 2020, we have an, an additional 175 new um, um, estimated occupancy by June 2020. It'll be 175 units. So again, that's another, you know, I think that so, AP stats class should be charged <laughs> with finding out a formula that actually right, works yeah, for Hopkinton, kind of honestly. So, so I just want to go back though, like, like it really helps to see it visually and it helps to look at historic trends and, right. and, and separate different dates and whatnot because I hear a lot of different numbers thrown out there and some of them are since January 1st, some of them are since the school year, some are right. looking forward. <laughs> uh, it's really hard to understand what's what and I think just a really quick visual that shows number of new students per year dating back however long, um, that would be really helpful to me. So I'm uh, not going to discuss it now. I just, sure, sure. if this goes forward, I'd, I'd recommend that that be part of the what, Hold on one second. Comment. Uh, growth can be a double-edged sword. And <coughs> what you're pointing out 2020, say if there is a moratorium, it, it goes to 19 to 2019 to 2020. I understand that it won't change legacy farms. Is that correct? That's true. If something's already planned and approved. And okay, okay. So, so let me just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm stomping all over your moment. Um, but a, a bigger conversation certainly includes the entire community, including oh, Legacy right. Farms, yes. But this would have a positive impact if there's a moratorium on slowing and stopping growth in 2021, which is really the fiscal year we're looking forward to planning for now. I mean, starting July. Right, and I, I guess we don't have numbers for that. Um, for but I think also one of the other points made was, um, you know, there's a lot of agricultural land in our town, and as folks decide what they're going to do with that land, and as you all decide what what's going to happen to that land, um, you know, probably 15 years ago, pro people weren't thinking we would have an additional 300 students from, you know, the new building in, at Legacy Farm. We, you know, it's just difficult to sort of extrapolate out 10, 15 years the number of people that are going to be coming in, and I think. Adjusting so, the growth is the critical piece. Just to how outline, you do it. outline, I'm sorry, to outline how difficult we had a professional consultant to help us with that. I mean, it's dif it is difficult. It is. And, and the formulas and the, and the conversation never seems to really, um, really fit what we experience in Hopkinton. And I think that that um, is a byproduct of an amazingly excellent school department. And, you know, it's a... <laughs> good problem to have, but it's a very real problem. It is, it is. And, you know, we don't want to <coughs> ignore the other departments in town who are right. feeling the same I, strain. I, I absolutely appreciate you commenting on that because it's, it's very important that we don't lose sight of the pressures on all departments. Well, one last thing. For the viewers at home and in the audience, the significance of the 300 students from Legacy Farms, can you explain that? Well, I mean, at, any time you add 300 students to, a, to a, an existing school system, you're going to feel the strain. And I think um, one of the numbers that might be good to show you as well would be sort of how much the general education budget has gone up over the last several years in response to the added growth. You know, our kids are um, still receiving an excellent education. Obviously, we, we hear about this, but there's the, the things that have had to be done, the creativity that has to go into it has been incredible by the superintendent and her admin team and all of the teachers and I feel like there's a there's sort of a critical point right we're gonna hit that point at some point where we we're gonna have so many kids in a classroom because we don't have the physical space to put them someplace else. but with legacy farms we also have an agreement we hit a certain threshold the developer would provide extra money yes to make up yes for that. yes so. and we're, we're waiting to find out the, the plan for that yes Are you close to that um I hope so <laughs> <laughs> through the chair, I believe that's also a, a one-time payment. Right. It is. Right. It is. Yes, there's, there's several of them structured out over, over the course of, of um, a timeline, but 
Yes, yes, the one. But it helps as a to. buffer in between. And it could potentially, but that only helps. Speaking selfishly, it only helps the schools, but we got a lot of other people who are feeling the stream too. So I think we need to look at the town as a whole. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Good to have you as our liaison. Thank you. First day. This First is day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, hold on one second, Darlene. I'm sorry. And Zedek, 39 East Main. I'm all in favor of this one year growth restriction as a trial, at least. This whole subject is so many years overdue uh, <laughs> and needs, uh, it's, it's just going uh, totally out of control. And uh, all the problems we have with the schools and so forth. So I am very much in favor. Finally, a group has taken the bull by the horns and started the ball rolling. And so I'm very much in favor of go doing with the one year growth restriction and seeing how it works and getting going uh, mm -hmm. with meetings and uh, all the town boards and so forth. So uh, um, thank you. If I may, through the chair, Mrs. Zedek was on the school committee too. Yes, a few uh, years uh, ago. Oh, here's <laughs> what we need back here is Judy Wiley oh. and Chuck Zedek <laughs> <laughs> on the planning board. Right. There you go. Hi, Darlene Hayes, One Third Road. Um, I agree a lot what's being said about the processes and like really looking and taking our time. But I want to echo what Mrs. Zedek said. The one year does seem like a solution for short term to give you that time to buffer it out, figure it out, and to think about. H camp's a wonderful thing. Th these guys are awesome because you know you get to watch these meetings at home and watch last year the joint um, budget meeting with the selectmen and the um, school committee, hash it out and hash it out and hash it out, and it was painful to watch. <laughs> and to hear comments like, can we, can, maybe we just can't afford to have the best schools anymore. You know, I don't, I, I've heard people that come up here and are so supportive of the schools, and they don't have kids in the system anymore, but they know that is a driver for the town, and that we need the time to develop the process maybe for the three year, but the one year is a buffer to like figure some stuff out and want to keep the best schools. That's it. Thanks, Tony. So I, come ahead. I just want the, the public that's gathered for this conversation to know that we have at most 10 more minutes um, and then we're gonna wrap up this, this piece of the input. So if you have something that you'd like to say <clears throat> to contribute to this, make a plan to come forward. Yes. Well, I just wanted to make a comment on something you said earlier. Uh, I've been volunteering. Uh, you actually have to introduce yourself. Oh, Mary Jo Lafreniere, 18 Walcott Valley Drive. I have been out a lot at the senior center. I've been volunteering there and, and talking to a lot of people, and, and not just seniors, other volunteers. So. And the one thing I'm hearing is that people are saying to me, we, we made this town, we worked in this town, we, we made it the great town that everybody wants to come to, and all of a sudden they feel totally disenfranchised. They feel like they're not really part of the community anymore, that people are just, you know, doing things and, and not including them. And the other, the main thing is that they aren't going to be able to stay here. This last tax bill has frightened them to death, <laughs> a lot of them. And, they're at fixed incomes. They've been at fixed incomes for a number of years and been able to get by. But they're looking at, at where we're headed or where it looks like we're headed, and they know they're not going to be able to much longer. And they're in their own homes. They want to stay in their own homes. I'm not talking about seniors that, you know, in, in the uh, senior housing or anything. I'm talking about people in general around town that have retired um, and have been getting by okay and not really complaining too much but this one has just really hit them badly i'm hoping that uh, the means tested exemption will help a lot of them but it's not going to be enough for uh and it's not the ones that are in the the real low income brackets they're getting exemptions and things it's the people that are getting like uh 40 between 40 and fifty thousand dollars in retirement a year which was was plenty to get by before but it isn't now. And they're just really worried about their futures. And uh, 
I'd like to see some kind of study uh, including them because like I said they, they feel like they built this community uh -huh. and now nobody's paying any attention to them and I know that's not true but that's how they feel yeah I appreciate that um, I would also invite everybody who's here as they've been sort of listening to people and so forth uh, to to send forward um, ideas of constituency groups and key issues that we really should be considering as we go forward. We've talked about a lot of them, but I'm sure that we have not talked about a lot of them as well. And if we're able to pull together something that um, is substantially meaningful, we want to make sure we, we include everybody that needs to be included. Yes. I was just going to say in response to um, Mary Jo, is when we look at the impact to schools, which is our, our biggest expense, we're looking at it in terms of, of new growth but I think part of the thing that we need to look at is how much of our, our new school people are coming from older existing houses because older people are leaving town. Mm. We have a great school system. They're selling to young families with 2.5 children that are coming in and they're starting the whole thing again. My kids have been through the school system. Um, if I leave now, my house is gonna go to new children. And that, that I think is something that would be worthwhile our addressing, mm -hmm. maybe in some sort of tax credit that's, that's substantial for the older people of the community to keep them in their houses. That's starting to be me. It's starting to make me feel uncomfortable. So I just, I just think we need to look at the other things that are impacting the town's finances rather than just new growth. Yeah. I, I would echo her comment because I think, and, had, and having been on the board now almost five years, We've seen some of the projections from Legacy. We kind of knew that these were coming, but there's been a miss somewhere because what was coming in from Legacy and what's actually hitting the schools, whew. So, I mean, yes, we're talking about a process. I think the urgency is when do you get a process in place and when do they start moving and making actionable <coughs> insights? And it's gonna be a large constituency. And it's almost like, you know, healthcare, right? There's a lot of things that need to be kind of addressed and in play, mm -hmm. but until we get that ball rolling quickly, we're going to be here kicking the candy down the road a year mm -hmm. from now. Yep, I agree. I agree. Uh, has everybody who came to say something on those had their had their moment? Yep. Please come forward. Diane Cambrellis, Twenty One Ash Street, and I just want to um, kind of piggyback on the the last topic that was addressed. Um, I think it's pretty clear. I think we've heard through much of the conversation that a lot of the the, the taxing uh, effect on the town is from uh, certain developments. And I know that there was some discussion about one of the proposals affecting um, ANR and the other one not. And those that, for people, older people that have been in, in town for a while, they've had their property, that have expectations of what they're gonna do with their property. And to have a one year moratorium, moratorium it's kind of like a one year time where you might be deciding what to do, but they can't do anything with it. And that just doesn't seem fair to me. <coughs> People that have invested in it, that could be their, their uh, retirement, something they're expecting to do with it, something they've been planning for years. It could be uh, possibly to, to fund college tuitions and things like that. And to just all of a sudden change something on them, I don't think would be fair to a lot of people in this town. So um, I think if there were to be a study, then I would hope that, uh, that there would be consideration about that and looking at specifically where are these additional children coming from and target it so that it's not penalizing people that have been in this town for years and years and are not able to do with what they thought they would be able to do with their personal investment because it's a personal investment as opposed to a business and that the ratios and the impact on that are much much greater when it's a personal investment versus a business. Um, I guess that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I think if people can still sell their homes, it's, that's something that's not. She's talking about any ANRs, splitting up your property yeah. to fund your child's education. Um, I want to thank everybody who participated um, in this conversation, um, and I, you know, I'd also like to thank the petitioners for um, <laughs> getting people in the room um, because you know we. We collectively haven't been able to do that, um, or haven't haven't done that. 
Um, and I think that it's abundantly clear that the time um, is now that we need to have a really vibrant, constructive, multifaceted conversation that um, includes a lot of constitu all the constituency groups um, and uh, is forward-looking in, in from a planning perspective. Um, is anybody ready to vote on those two uh, proposed articles? Aye. Uh, I will entertain a motion on the one-year growth restriction citizens petition. I was going to say I think we probably need more time to discuss this. And I have questions for Amy uh, as well. Um, after this part of the discussion, there's uh, things that have come up. Uh, I definitely prefer the one-year uh, plan. Um, Do you have a question you want to ask now? Uh, Over the petitioners? Did she leave? <laughs> I, I don't think they've left. Sure. Amy, Frank has a question. Thank you. Hi, Amy. For clarification for the one-year plan, uh, are ANRs included or not? Because they are by the asterisk on the first page, but they're not by the breakdown on the two-column page. Okay, so let's see. The one-year, I think Deb said. Would include, ANRs would be restricted, but you could have a no more than so 12 dwelling units town wide in a year and no more than two per person so but ANRs would be included in that 12. so I think that's opposite of what we heard earlier I think it might be okay yeah because I actually took a note <laughs> um okay so ANRs would not be exempted in the one year um in your in your next page on the PowerPoint, there is an asterisk saying that it is excluded. Um, the one year it says it doesn't apply to the Osmond. Right, it says um, twelve building permits for new dwelling units should be authorized by the town during the period that this section is in effect. Yes. There's an asterisk there. <coughs> yes. So just okay. that it doesn't apply to the Osmond zoning. On the same page at the bottom, it says the asterisk means does not apply to the Osmond. Mm -hmm. But does apply for A and R. Yes. Okay, I was going to the next page where the asterisk means does not apply to A and R's. Right. Okay. And, and I don't know if I hope I'm not too out of turn. I don't know if you read the town council's comments. Um, it sounded like the subdivision garden apartment village housing phasing would not actually do what we intended. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you guys have not, have not discussed mm -hmm. that. Would they have it actually? There are loopholes that the um, a builder could. Do. So the town council's yes, comments in our packet on the subdivision phasing indicate that it wouldn't really do what we intended, um, that there are loopholes, like somebody could build a subdivision road and then develop each single property as an a and R, so it wouldn't really prevent the subdivision anyway. Mm -hmm. So to make sure you have read the path, you guys have yeah. that. Yeah. Um, discussion, question for Amy. Yeah. As the originator of this, how would you feel if um, about a one year moratorium not including a and R plans? Well, I think someone could just build a, a big subdivision and make everything an ANR. So I don't know if that would really accomplish the restriction. So I'd like to make a motion to not support the one year. Oh, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah. So there's a motion um, not to support the one year growth restriction. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right, is there further discussion among the board members? I would support the one-year moratorium, but not including A and R, because I think we need more discussion, another meeting in order to cover this more fully. Um, you, the the more discussion you need to cover it more more fully, basically means you need to to rewrite it, rethink it have a direction to it, have a plan to go with it. I don't think, I think it's that's right. beyond our capabilities in the amount of time that we have between now and it hitting the floor of town meeting. Or even the amount of time we have tonight. I, I don't think that with that, she's that far away from a very viable uh, viable plan. So there's, Frank, there's if I may, if this helps, this doesn't keep, um, this doesn't keep it from going forward if petitioners choose to go forward. This right. is just about the planning board's support of it as it's written. Um, and we can have another meeting on it if it is is adjusted, and we could potentially have a different vote on it if that happened. I would but look forward to seeing it amended. 
All right, so we have a motion. Second. We have a second. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? Nay. Okay, thank you. Um, I will entertain a motion on the subdivision garden apartment village housing phasing the citizens petition. <coughs> Let us make a motion to not support it. Is there a second? Second. Okay, is there further discussion? Um, so all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? I'm going to uh, abstain from this vote. And abstentions, which is the same as voting no. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would like to thank everybody <coughs> who came and has invested a lot of time and energy um, into this conversation. I, I don't know if you heard me when you were out there. Um, I'm actually a big fan of bold moves. And um, I appreciate that this conversation has been forcefully initiated. I, I think that um, I've made it abundantly clear that I, <coughs> I would have preferred to, to see us be a little bit more nuanced and, and within the process. Um, but I just want to make sure that I'm on the record as saying I support um, the meetings that is necessary to kick this off before town meeting um, and to structure some sort of plan that um, however the articles go might be part and parcel to the, um, to the overall effort. Okay, thank you all. All right, so we have uh, two minutes. We have the solar. Right? What? We'll take we got water. Yeah, yeah. we'll take a two minute nice break. Yeah. Here, so two minute break. We'll come back. Yeah. 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 So, which, what order are we going in? Just so I can queue up. The so we're actually going to move. Uh, we're going to probably have to continue it. We're going to move to other items on the agenda. Okay, fair enough. And you have to stop holding things in your hand. No, I did that once. I didn't even notice. Like throw a little bit. What was what was what I was talking? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait though. You'll know. It's a tell. Oh. <laughs> Yep. Right. They want to continue it, though. I, I think he's here. here. Yeah. They want to ask him. Well, he's continuing. <laughs> yeah. Standing in the ocean and the waves are coming in. You're continuing, right? Are you continuing? Because he got you. He's got you. He's continuing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah, I think I've come up to speak with that all that was cold. Okay. Okay, perfect. That's good. I wasn't sure. We're just checking because right? he saw you out there. Right. He's also interested just in zoning and, and development. So have to open it. We do well, we have to, to continue it. That's all. That's all. But you don't have to do it. You don't have to. All right. Cool. Thanks, Ron. <coughs> so um, I just want to say to my vice chair that I would like to propose a an extra meeting uh, an organizational uh, structure. Okay. So, so, so. That's only like even a, I don't know, sorry, is it even possible? Um, but like a three hour meeting is devoted to this kind of board. Yes, no, no, we have to be committed. Yes, only, yes. Independent mm -hmm. Everybody's got to have yep. stage. That's my thought. Nah, I'm right there. I'll do it. Right there. So when Gary gets back, we'll assume two minutes is up. Oh, and Carol. Oh, yep. and Dave. Yeah. I haven't seen this. So we should um, actually, and I think we can do this. We'll come back into session. We had our two minute break. They were slow coming back. Um, I will entertain a motion to open and continue the Whisper Way definitive open space definitive subdivision plan and extend a decision. So moved. Okay. Second. Wait. Oh, wait. <laughs> to May 13th at 7.30. 7.30. Um, and the decision until? May 28th. May 28th. Okay. Now go. May so moved. <laughs> so, so Mario, I see the applicant is here. Second. Yes, we checked with him. Second. 
So it's been moved and seconded. Um, so we're just continuing the Whisper Way uh, subdivision hearing and the decision, the hearing to May 13th at 7.30, the decision to May 28th. Any discussion? All those in favor? Oh, Frank. Um, they, they waited a long time tonight. Was there something we said tonight that kind of put them off or are they? No, no, no. this was in the plan. Yeah, we double checked. We made sure. Oh, but we had to wait till nine. because We would have had to wait till nine anyway. Oh, because of the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Good point. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, and then. Um, <coughs> um, I thought they were going to change this. Oh, boy. See those? Those are pretty much. I was asking. Yes. Yeah. I think we should go back to Somer, or should we just do these? These are not going to be super simple, but. I'm sorry, I'm conferring with my, <laughs> my vice um, chair. My scheduling partner. <laughs> <laughs> If we can try to get the solar in, we might as well just. We need to do it. Close to it. Otherwise, but we're going to do them too, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're going to have to. We're, we're going to. We're making an executive decision, and I'm sorry to those who came for 905. That's going to be pushed forward a little bit, but we will get to it tonight. Um, we're going to um, go back to the solar. Um, hearing that was continued to following the discussion of the zoning articles. Oh, and we need to also continue the zoning article discussion, the, oh, the public hearing on the zoning articles. Yes. yes. Um, okay. So, um, where could we fit the next discussion for zoning articles? Can that happen anytime between now and town meeting? Or is there a deadline? Yeah. Should be sooner rather than later. Yes. Yes. That's correct. To put. Is there a question, <laughs> sir? <laughs> yes. There are a number of articles that you have not finally yes voted to put on. No, on. we have. They're they're on. They're placeholders on the war March. When is the deadline to remove? But we haven't right. voted recommendations. We, we haven't voted on recommendations. Okay. But if we were to remove so any of them, is there a deadline? I understand the question. So before the twenty third. Be signed on the twenty third of April. So it would be so. excellent if we could do it early April. <laughs> it would be better if you did it. Yes. 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 It would be okay. You, what you don't want to do is do it after the twenty third of April. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> tentatively set aside a half an hour at the next meeting. If April. 8th. Yes. So I. What time does that half hour commence? Eight thirty on April. I will entertain motion. Do we have more time than thirty minutes? Just being realistic. Here. I'm going to look at that that agenda, but not at this moment. Okay. Um, I, I will entertain a motion to continue the public hearing on the zoning bylaw amendments to April. What day? Eight. Eight. At seven. Eight thirty. Eight thirty p.m. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, and to your point, Gary, I will look and see what's there to see if I can carve out more time. I just can't answer that right now. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, <coughs> now um, I will we'll bring back the solar discussion. Yep. Solar. Solar. Let me see if I can find Joe this. And Chris. Okay. So, um, so shh. Uh, excuse me. You're on TV. Just so you know. I apologize to you. Just yeah. don't do that again. Um. Okay. So, I think you wanted to make some of your points. I thank you very much. Yes. I was really trying to gather myself around to where I am. Um, so, um, we will have another opportunity for public comment. I'm going to I'm going to detail my comments, um, and then uh, the applicant, if they have any further quick comments, and then the public. Um, I want to make sure I hear from everybody. Um, I made it really clear at the last um, session of this public hearing that. Um, that our best work is to negotiate the best possible project has to happen in this room. For anybody to expect 
um, a great result for any constituency and the judicial process is probably not <coughs> not um, the best place to put your hopes, particularly the public, particularly the town. The town um, uh, is better served if we can come up with um, a decision that is um, entirely defensible and as structured as clearly and in as detailed a fashion as we want it to be. Um, I also appreciate that uh, the solar panels in particular have been removed and the 75 foot buffer has been accommodated because I think that that was something that we were not going to be able to get past. Um, listening to my fellow board members, <coughs> um, I guess I would favor option B. If I'm being totally candid, I would favor option A because it doesn't involve any changes to the scenic ruin and it's a small buffer. The, the area that we would be asked to waive, um, but that's tomato, tomato to me, um, to be honest with you. Um, as long as, certainly as long as it is more, um, more amenable to the residents who live on the street, I would rather do it the way that seems more, more beneficial to them. Um, when we think about um, a, the conditions that we want to put on, we're gonna, we, we need to uh, address each of, of the decision points. Um, and as we're walking through this, I hope that board members are thinking about conditions um, that they want to make sure we include in either in the decision, whether it's an up or down, um, so that it is um, a stronger decision and more clear to all parties involved. So um, the, the, uh, the game fence is something that has been, um, uh, has been talked about a lot, and I am in favor of adding that to the conditions to include the fence for large, large game. Um, the above ground utilities in the center of the project, um, I find myself um, feeling like it makes sense to avoid that big old gas line. and. Um, also work in concert with the Conservation Commission who would rather have um, less disruption than in the wetlands and I don't see that as an adverse impact on, um, on the neighbors. For, um, uh, I do think that we talked about early and we have somehow dropped uh, intentional screening on the Hanowich property which is at 14 Wilson Street. Um, if they are desiring of it. Obviously, you can't put screening on a person's property if they don't want it. We did talk about including it, and that did fall off the conditions, and I'm in favor of adding that to the conditions. Um, let's see. Um, I understand that that means that we would have to specifically permit the ability to do the above ground poles, but that is not a waiver that is required. Um, on the interconnection piece, um, I was pretty, um, I was pretty strong on wanting to uh, fully fledge out the option um, from the industrial side. I still think that that would have been the right thing to do. Um, I understand also from the materials that we have, we have to balance our our authority in that question. I do appreciate uh, that um, the connection will be undergrounded, um, and that, that makes a big difference to me. Um, I also appreciate that we have, um, we have negotiated some really distinct benefits that other members have mentioned, so I won't go into them at length, but the preservation of the Native American cultural and historical uh, stone structures, um, maintaining the necessary buffer to the existing residences, um, the additional intentional screening and the willingness to be um, uh, flexible to <coughs> Uh, making sure that that is um, adequate in all seasons. Um, I really, I guess I would favor no disturbance to the scenic road. I had put that down there, but if option B is the preferred option, um, I can certainly work with the permit that's necessary for the scenic road um, personally. Um, as far as safety, I, I am mindful that part and parcel of this proposal is a police detail during construction, which I think is both necessary and uh, appreciated. Um, 
there is substantial and significant screening. I think that I want to make sure that the abutters are um, as satisfied as abutters can be. I think that there is a, there's a balance. Um, I too have driven through Alexander Road. I too have seen how um, it changes the, the, the um, solar farm behind those properties, changes their outlook um, and their enjoyment of their properties. Um, and there's, we were, we didn't waive any distance there, um, but we didn't also ask for additional plantings, and I think um, that makes that makes a big difference. Um, the farm gate at the road is appreciated, um, and I am mindful of the fact that our scenic road jurisdiction does not necessarily does not specifically extend past the streetscape and the right of way. Um, so um, I. Um, am in favor of um, those additions, and I would be amenable to um, to a conversation on some sort of um, uh, carbon effect equation calculation that we um, that we commit to. And I don't know what that is for the trees coming down and the panels going in. Um, and I know that that's a bit of a difference for tonight. That that came out of the conversation tonight. Um, and it makes sense to me, so I, I throw that out there. Um, so those are my quick thoughts. Let me just make sure I did um, write down some thoughts that other people had that I want to make sure I don't leave out if. Um, uh, Mr. Shambo asked about a row of screening, even though um, it's off uh, off his the 75 foot. Is that something you could? work with so his his letter we were working on what he asked for last meeting and his letter said that he would be okay with a I think a 40 foot or a 45 foot or a 50 foot buffer on that west side yep um, as long as there was some screening and so we gave him a 75 foot buffer yep and the point of that was to be, because we're not disturbing that area yep it's hard to plant yeah because that's not an area that's been mowed on that west side I think that's an established area, and so by, by leaving it established, that might be better screening. I will, uh, I will uh, contemplate that feedback. Yeah. <coughs> um, I didn't even ask Mrs. Hanniewicz when she was up here about the screening, but that is, we would, we would write it in such a way that certainly it had to be amenable to the property owners. Um, Uh, Amy asked a question on detrimental. Um, I find that at this juncture, I want to make sure I lay over the conversation, the feed, if I can find it, for heaven's sakes, the feedback that is specific from the Attorney General um, to us, to the Town of Hopkinton, when they reviewed our zoning bylaws. Um, and that uh, they say the Planning Board may approve the special permit with conditions, which may include the requirement of a performance bond posted with the town to guarantee proper maintenance and or removal of the commercial, et cetera, which we have, um, and a performance bond to guarantee proper construction, which I believe is also in there. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Never mind. Um, the Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 3, reads in part, no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems or the building of structures that facilitate the collection of solar energy, except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. So I have satisfied myself completely on public health and, and safety. The question I have for the, the attorney um, is what um, the public welfare might include. You're welcome. <laughs> <coughs> OK. so. Broadly speaking, anything that benefits the public yeah. uh, is the public welfare. Um, and <coughs> um, uh, 40A Section 3, that particular sentence is a bit of a mystery because it incorporates, it, it um, says you can't unreasonably regulate unless you address, uh, you're doing so for public health, safety, or welfare. 
Uh, but I don't think it means to imply that in those circumstances you can unreasonably right. regulate. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, yeah. so what it actually says and what it means are, um, uh, are probably a, a, a bit different. What it means is that if you have a valid public um, purpose for imposing a condition and the condition is otherwise reasonable, then it's okay. Um, and um, so I think that if there is something that you want to address that you can't tie specifically to public health or safety, but you nevertheless think that it is um, a, a benefit to the public, you should probably have a conversation about, about whether the restriction that you're about to propose is in fact reasonable. And generally, when you're thinking about what's reasonable, you think about what is the cost of, of, of the, uh, uh, the restriction and how much benefit are you actually going to get out of it. Thank you. Okay. So, yes. I did have one additional comment, if Perfect. I may. Yep. Um, so, I just back to the underground utilities, I just want to make the point that um, from what I'm hearing, people are saying that the only option is to go underground the gas, and therefore it's a big thing. But that is not the only option. There's two points of entrance that would not have to even touch the, the gas line. So I just want to make that point. And people seem re, um, like they want to move the connection to Cedar Street, whereas if you did have two points of entry, it would be on both sides, just for good or for worse, you know. Mm -hmm. But yep. to, as I stated, it's it's just a wire down under the ground. It's not very uh, obtrusive. Well, I think if I could hold on one second, yeah, just make sure I was looking this way. Just make sure I, I recognize you. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I think Chris could give us an idea of what size those pieces of equipment could be and what you're planning to screen them with the, the, the pieces across the row and what kind of power source, how much power is running through them? Uh, sure, the, the cabinets, I mean, they vary in size. I know um, one of the previous memos um, had included a representative picture um, of the cabinets. They roughly sit on uh, maybe a six foot, <coughs> excuse me, six foot by eight foot pad. Um, you know, typically they're no taller than three to four feet high um, it varies depending on the, the the make of the box itself um, the plantings that we're surrounding it with are um, I believe boxwoods um, with a final plant height that would exceed the actual height of the cabinet so the idea is that the screening that we would group around the cabinets would provide an, an instantaneous wall of green if you will to make it so you wouldn't be able to see it um, yeah, boxwood um, um, with a final plant size, a minimum plant size of four feet high to six feet high. So, and through the chair, how how close are those? The cabinets the themselves. To the road. To yeah. the road. Oh. Uh, they're set back roughly forty feet, more or less, off of the roadway. The, uh, one you. other question, would it be, instead of boxwoods, uh, would it be possible to put something that's more indigenous to Hopkinton? Um, sure. When I mean, I think that would be something that would be um, <coughs> more appealing to people, something that's more indigenous to the, the forest land um, and um, would grow there naturally. Um, yes, absolutely. Value is hot, you know. Sure. The, the notes are, the language in the notes, understanding this is often, you know, a, a mm -hmm. point. Um, they're written to allow flexibility, to allow, you know, species sizes and spacing to be, um, and, and, and substitutions um, where warranted are allowed, you know, with, pre with previous approval from the town and to make sure that our landscape professional can ascertain whether or not it's an appropriate species for the specific location so that they're not, you know, ill-suited for the environment and, you know, basically die off. Um, so, you know, I think that if there was something specific that you wanted to see in that area, I think that there are enough levels of reevaluation and pre-construction 
um, that we would be amenable to, say, doing a pre-construction species selection meeting with a representative from the board or a li liaison with the board and our landscape professional to really target these areas. Um, and as you noted, as importantly, come back during the non-foliar months to ensure you know, you know, we feel that what we're providing is adequate, but if maybe some of the surrounding abutters, um, you know, an opportunity to review it from their particular, you know, piece, I think the language provides a mechanism for the board to, you know, allow for substitutions and fill in any holes if any do exist. So to the chair, are you opening it up to, for us yeah, to yep. discuss yep. what your I'm points I'm just were? mindful of the time. I would like to make sure we wrap up in, in like, 10 minutes because the public needs an opportunity to take their last crack at this. Okay. Um, I would, I guess I would take the step forward to vote for um, the um, access B in that it maintains that 75 foot buffer. I think it's really important as a board that we maintain structure and I think that there are reasons codes and zoning um, laws are made. And so I'm in favor of B. I think the, ro the, 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 the rubble wall, it's not even really fully constructed, as you had said. Um, it can be opened up very easily, um, and then that would grandfather us 20 feet on either side to be done properly um, um, within our, you know, the criteria of a farm wall. And so I think that would do like sort of a twofold, a twofold thing, and um, then appropriately turning the plan around and planting the, the screening in the appropriate area. And I would take one more step um, that not only would the planting be screening the immediate structures, but it would take that understory and make it a little bit more evergreen within that, I think it's now 120 foot, 112 foot buffer because you've removed those planters. So if, if they were, for example, if they were a rhododendron, to put a few rhododendron around so that it really looks like it's been untouched um, within that 100, 121 foot buffer. So, so my, my preference would be to go with B because it maintains the regulations that we're required to make. Um, and then the only waiver would be what we, we ultimately cannot change, which would be the poles in the center. And it's not a waiver, is it? It's a, right. a what? There's no waiver that's specifically required. We would have to specifically permit that. that oh, permit, to okay. The permit that would be required for that. Okay. So. Yes, Gary. Um, I think, Mr. King, last time you had mentioned, I don't remember, is, it was, I don't remember if you had said that you would potentially, um, sorry, that you would, uh, be willing to provide some additional bond or something in relation to plantings to make sure that everyone was was satisfed. Um, there's a I don't know, ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars. I and, think it's and, in the it's in the it, the conditions. And I guess what I propose is I, I know there's a lot of questions around screening. I don't think we need to answer those all now. To your point, but I'm wondering if if we were to include that bond of some capacity, and then we were to have a representation from the planning board and some of the abutters to just finalize all that things. I, I didn't know if that would be something that you would be uh, amenable to. Because I think that way we could. Um, I know, I, I know um, what we've done in the past with respect to, so the bond ensures all the screening that's on the plan or in the decision. Um, and I know in the past we've designated a, a, a of a not to exceed set amount to be evaluated if there's an off-site mitigation, which has to be agreed to, I think, by us because it's off-site. Okay. So I think two potential locations were identified by the chair of 14 Wilson Street if, uh, and uh, Mr. Chambeau's property. And so I, what I would suggest is um, relative to, to what's needed in the size to set a figure that and we'd be amenable to something like a thousand dollars of property of off-site mitigation up to a thousand of off-site mitigation on their property if they choose to take advantage of it something like that as a condition of approval so that it's it's earmarked for them and doesn't come out of the bond you, you know what i mean so it's a separate it's it's a it's okay. a so, so you'd prefer to keep it separate separate cool. well i think it's i think it's easier for you to enforce okay All right to keep it separate because you're, you're you've still got the whole bond 
if there's something wrong with any of the screening. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate the clarity. The other thing I wanted to mention, though, on the yeah. on the um, wildlife corridor. Yes. Um, uh, we had the chief happened to be here, uh, and so we had talked to him about. Oh, he is here. We had talked <laughs> him about. Chief it. is still here. And, and so, if the board, we would be amenable to a condition that there be a, a, a roughly 80 foot wildlife corridor in the section that was shown where it hinges on the left I side of the it. map. Uh, and you, the condition should say that we provide uh, additional uh, two two gates and knock bo knocks boxes. That would that would be ultimately what would be wanted. And the, what kind of boxes? Knocks. For the emergency responders. Yeah, K N O X. Yeah. Knocks box. Not that not that I didn't know how to spell it, but I do appreciate that because I did not know how to spell it. <laughs> I appreciate it. As well. I was going phonetics. Yeah. <laughs> Can you point out where that eighty foot? Sure. It's on the narrowest portion of the. <coughs> You neck down where the two wetlands pinch in, and so we would basically run this fence straight across, run this fence straight across, it would effectively open up roughly an 80 foot wide wildlife corridor, if you will. We would still provide the gaps around the perimeter fence. Um, and as Attorney Pichella noted, we would just provide two additional NOx boxes to allow um, 24 hour emergency access. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, earlier tonight I asked for documentation from Eversource, um, and I'm going to return to it, but I never really heard an agreement to s s provide that to us. Would that be something you guys will, can do, will do? Let me take that. Um, I, th I think you were talking about, you were saying Eversource, but I, I had understood it to mean um, Tennessee gas because that that's what involves the um, the interconnect on Cedar Street versus Wilson Street would be so, ever source so just 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 to backtrack and I, I know we've gone over this a few times um, the uh, originally on this project all of the engineers involved get together and determine with conversations with ever source who is um, notably uh, and typically unwilling to put almost anything in writing as to whether we should connect and, and we're proposing to them do you want us to connect on this this side or on that side and what they're looking at is the um, uh, different factors and I, I had the terminology but there's two different factors the rigidity and the, and the amount of capacity I think for the lines and they're determining not whether or not both sets of lines don't have the capacity to take on even the small amount of, of energy that's created by this project. And so this is a way for the utility to essentially get upgrades. And so what the utilities do is they essentially tax the developer by saying, if you're gonna connect into our lines on either street, you've gotta upgrade them by a million eight or whatever that number is. And I've never seen it done where we've upgraded two different sets of lines by splitting a project. Um, they determine that the most cost effective and appropriate location based on wetlands, et cetera, what everyone knew at the time was, was the side that we chose. We proceeded with that. The bylaws don't require or, or don't give the board any deference as to choosing where we interconnect. But what it tells us is, is to put it underground. And we've done that. Um, we also have uh, an approved uh, <coughs> ISA, which took, was, ju was just approved and it took, I think, 20 months to get from, um, from Eversource. And uh, to require us to have a condition that requires us to seek any additional approval would put us, um, would essentially uh, make the, it would be almost impossible at this point to, to, to do anything to change that. Um, Excuse me one second. I'm also mindful, Frank, that we got information in the packet that we have limited authority in that area as well. Sure, but so I really think we need to move past that. But I have a valid question. I'm sure um, you do. So really, tonight when I asked and you didn't answer, you don't have anything writing from Eversource. So they they have provided we're, some information. We're, we're in not writing. we're not going to pursue that. We can't. Yeah. They, they, well, they they have provided things at previous meetings. Yes. No, I know. I know. On that I know. topic. But so. but bear with me. I did run this by Ray, and I think it's important enough uh, to bring up because I want clarity. And I think the neighbors that I've spoken to want clarity too. 
uh, is there in, in writing or is there not in writing whatever source said is there a preference or what whatever the scientific reasoning is above, above and beyond what they've already provided yes and I don't think that exists or we're not getting it so does it exist we, we've inquired to have something put in writing to provide you with more than what we provided which I would draw you to the September 25th, 2018 LIG Consultants Report, and they have refused to provide us something in writing. Fair enough. Um, I, I maybe think we shouldn't vote as a board until we have this information, just for clarity. Can I ask so, a follow-up question to Frank that might you, help? Yeah, hold on one second, though. We're, n we're not going to just hold the process hostage for something that the applicant can't reasonably get up. Uh, yes. So I would ask my fellow board member what is the big deal with coming in that side it's going to be underground you're going to hardly notice it the boxes are going to be screened what what's the big concern it's an existing pole, it's an existing pole. it should be on the commercial side not to what why what's the problem what's the, the aesthetically i know it's a through the chair sorry <laughs> no it's all right I, I get it so um but I really, is there a benefit it actually doesn't matter because right. we have we have the information right. that we're going to have. Right. Um, so I just kind of want to yeah, drive yeah, some efficiencies into this process. That understood. Is, I agree. Okay. One All last right. point: the improvement of the wires on Wilson Street. Will that improve service for the abutters on Wilson Street? Uh, I think undeniably that has to be a yes. But but I don't know that they're going to notice any difference. I think it just creates a a newer system of connection. Maybe less outages. Right. Right. Maybe less susceptible to storms. I'm, you know, I don't know. Here's hoping they get great service up there. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Fingers crossed. Okay. No, I, I discussed I'll, this, and it, there's two sides no, okay. to it. No, I know. I'm just, I'm just making reference to the fact that Eversource is prominent up there. They should, they ought to be servicing that section. That's all. It's like I'm on the sex, the quadrant with the town wells, and I love it because if my power goes out, it comes back really quickly, and I appreciate that. And I don't think it's for me, not for a second, but... Um, Here we go, we lost power. Uh, yeah. um, I am going to open it up for public comment um, at this point, okay? Thank you all for your patience. Can you hear me? Yeah. When, when we come back from public comment, I just have... Yes, of course. Yeah. Please remind me. Yes. Thank you, uh, Matt Zedek at 16 Wilson Street. Uh, just a few uh, follow-up comments based on the good conversation since the last round of uh, when the public was uh, able to offer their initial uh, thoughts this evening. Um, there was a bunch of talk about the fact that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is really pushing solar. Uh, the Clean Energy Center was mentioned. It was a good follow-up question from the, uh, the applicant I mentioned. Good follow-up question from the planning board about, hey, do you have any data to support that? And I believe the answer was no. So I do want to mention... Um, I do have something quoted from the Clean Energy Center um, because they are the key state agency that promotes solar in the Commonwealth, along with the Department of Energy Resources. So back in 2015, they actually had a uh, st uh, report done that relates specifically to the, um, the question about that aspect. So the, uh, the 2015 guide, Clean Energy Results, Question and Answers Regarding Ground-Mounted Solar Voltaic Systems produced by the Clean Energy Center. Quote, because trees offer multiple water management, cooling, and climate benefits, clear cutting of trees for the installation of ground-mounted solar PV is discouraged. So I just want to make sure that, for the record, um, we're hearing the Clean Energy Center being promoting solar. But obviously, the, the key folks promoting solar in the Commonwealth are saying, please, it's not encouraged to cut down uh, clear-cut trees. Um, Rel also related to that uh, was actually a uh, comment from the relative <coughs> to the environmental aspects of, that the planning board's um, supposed to, uh, is look looking at for this project. Uh, the town's uh, environmental consultant, as part of this report, um, Lucas Environmental said, a large portion of the work associated with the solar array installation will take place outside of jurisdictional buffer zones and resource areas. And that was specific to the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction. So again. A large part of the work being proposed is outside of the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction. Really uh, appreciate the fact that the Planning Board's um, keeping that in mind. Uh, secondly, the scenic road. I know there was a comment about uh, the Planning Board really can't factor in the scenic road aspect of this. 
And while well, technically true, that is because at this point no trees or stone walls <laughs> are being uh, asked to be um, impacted unless a different entrant point is uh, determined. I think it is important to point out in the scenic, ro uh, scenic road bylaw the criteria that helps establish what is a scenic road in town. We have roughly 15 scenic roads in town. So the criteria for, and this is from uh, uh, our zoning bylaws, section 160, uh, uh, subsection 3, in terms of recommending the designation as a scenic road, They're, and this is the criteria. Bordering trees which themselves constitute or are a significant part of natural or man-made features of aesthetic values. And because you're back, and I'm pointing this out because your background material, as I think you just mentioned, uh, Madam Chair, says the bylaw does not cover views of the scenic road or views from the scenic road. And because the word view was in the scenic road bylaw, I figured I'd mismention that. So it says that the trees which are part of vistas paralleling roadways or which create a frame of reference for more distant views and trees whose presence contribute substantially to the rural or woodland character of a roadway particularly in comparison to more developed or, or urbanized adjacent areas. So clearly, again, you're, if there's no vote on a wall or something, but I would suggest that how our scenic roads are approved at town meeting with the planning board's involvement means that you don't look at just the stone wall at the edge or the tree. You're looking at the vistas that look beyond that area as part of the overall uh, thing. Thirdly, about the utility connection, I'll be short because, again, I think I've mentioned it before, a commercial project should connect on the industrial zoned uh, side of the street um, in large part because many reasons but one of them the key ones is that the poles on the Cedar Street side are on the same side of the road as the proposed project simple you're connecting on the same side of the road they're proposing connecting on Wilson Street which would mean crossing a road sure digging up the <coughs> road doesn't sound much putting up a wire but we also heard about all the additional cabinets. It sounds like a nice indoor term in terms of cabinets, but we're talking big concrete structures and things. But uh, two other quick ones. Um, we heard of the argument about the cutting trees. Uh, uh, some members mentioned that, hey, if we don't uh, develop, uh, a person has a right to cut clear cut trees in their property. We can't control that, so we have to, as planning board members, weigh that versus a proposed project like this. I just would like to point out that in this particular, because we're just talking about this particular project and this land, Sure, they can cut trees. They can clear cut their trees. But it's 50% wetlands per our consultant and poorly draining soil. So right now, they can't go clear cut the trees. So I'm really hoping the planning board is not going to be making a decision which will help allow them to clear cut the trees. And then lastly, the key word, the detrimental, because that was a great question. That's what we've all been struggling with. What is detrimental? What's that word mean in terms of impacts to the neighborhood of the town? So I'd like to leave you with the following. Um, is, is this? project as currently proposed going to have no impact on the neighborhood of the town? Or is the project going to have a positive impact on the town of the neighborhood? And if it isn't, that means it's going to be a detrimental impact. Thanks very much. Thanks, Matt. Hi, um, I'm Cindy Sedek from 16 Wilson Street. And I just have a quick one. Um, as far as bus routes concerning safety issues, um, on Wilson Street, it's a very windy road with blind turns. And whenever I tell my son, if you're going to go down to the main, if you're going to go uptown, always be very mindful of the blind turns, stay in view, etc. And so when you're considering the opening, I'm proposing B, mm -hmm. because I think it brings you on a straightaway and it keeps you away from the blind turn. And you'll avoid, you know, big construction trucks coming in, you know, and that sort of thing. So um, I think um, for that, just to consider the bus safeties, each of the, um, each of the driveways is an individual bus stop because um, they don't consider it a safe route for kids. Mm -hmm. So that's all I'm asking. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> what a process. So, um, Tom Shambo, 15 Wilson Street, uh, been at the property for 24 years. Um, I appreciate what this planning board has done around this project. It's a tough piece of property. 
we didn't choose for them to build here, but they, the applicant has chosen to, and they have what they have. I appreciate what the applicant has done in terms of what they originally asked for and now where they are. I think, for me, I just would like to close with a couple of comments. Some people think I'm against this project. I have solar on my roof. I'm a solar fan. I tell my dad all about it, who used to be an electrician. He doesn't understand that you can you know, produce energy in different ways. So I'm for the project in the right way that protects the town, the environment, the neighbors, and in, in some ways the applicant. The applicant told us they will sell this project, likely within one or two years. So I know Lumber Street has already sold. You may or may not have known that. So the time to get what we want that, f to protect the town, the environment, the neighbors, would be now. And so I'll just end with that. Thank you for your service. You guys do a great job. Thank you, Tom. Mary or not, 51 Teresa Road. Uh, there was a question and discussion around some points that I made in carbon footprint. And again, I'm not opposed to solar generated energy. Uh, I think there are many other places where it makes good sense for Hopkinton to have solar panels, um, some of which include on the roof of your house or on the buildings uh, on, of our government buildings, schools, commercial buildings, etc. I think that Matt Zedek was very eloquent in what he said and very informative. He's given you everything you need to confidently reject this project and protect this neighborhood. And yet I feel that there's an undercurrent here that you still are concerned that if you choose to honor your original vote, which was to reject the project, that that will put the town in harm's way of a lawsuit. And again, I would like to reiterate that laws and bylaws are put into place to protect towns and the public and the people who live in the neighborhoods. And if every time a developer comes forward and wants to challenge that, we can't just give in to it because we don't want to face the cost, the time, and the energy to take it to court. You have all the grounds you need to reject this, legal grounds with the bylaws and existing <coughs> laws in place. So I hope you'll consider that very carefully before you make your final decision. And again, I urge you to reject this project and protect this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so. I have one bit of information um, that we were talking about. The US EPA Clean Energy's Equivalences Calculator is an online tool that, um, for, for those of solar panels uh, we have, and it tells us how much carbon we're offsetting. And I'm sure something similar is available. I haven't looked at that website, but whatever's available on that website would probably help people understand some of the questions we've had tonight about that. Thank you. Um, so for the public to understand, um, we have seven voting members on this. Um, Mrs. Dever and Mr. Durso are not eligible to vote on this. Um, for it to be successful, for there to be an approval, there needs to be six um, votes in favor of approving it, just so everybody understands um, the ground rules. So um, the first finding that we are required to make is that the buffers around, this is from zoning bylaw section 210.121.1, buffers around non-residential uses in residential uses which pertains in a requested waiver to the required buffer of 75 feet as shown on the plan. I believe that if we go with option B, what? Curious as to whether you were thinking of closing the meeting. So, uh, my planning board members, by process, like to keep it open until the vote has happened. But I had the same question when I started on the planning board. But the order of remand does say that we need to close the hearing, the hearing and then I, I read that. So, you know. So in the interest of doing it by the by the numbers, according to the decision. Oh. 
Thank you, Mary. I yes. did forget you. <laughs> so I was, I just had one point that I suggest we um, add to one of the conditions dealing with the stone structures, the um, Native American, um, that when decommissioning, you know, after the oh, useful yep. life of this solar farm, that um, that it that they also, um, you know, whoever owns the property at that point is <coughs> consulting the tribes and, and allowing them to be on site to, to observe and protect those zone structures during the deconstruction. Second. Yep. Um, I'd like to amend that slightly. Um, I'm not sure what the decommissioning wording says now. Can Doesn't you clarify that? It up for so we're going to just capture the idea of the condition. Okay, so then, and then what I'd like to do we'll is that it's later. also that the planting isn't just grass that's covered on top, that it's something that's consistent with what it was originally. Because what's going to happen is solar, solar equipment's going to become more efficient. And so it's going to reduce. So it's even before decommissioning, it's going to be changing. So the, the plan is going to get smaller and smaller, and we're going to have open, vacant space. And so it can be There's but more. That, the process, that, that the process of changing somehow gets written in there that it becomes, um, once again, what it woodland, what it was before, if possible. Replantation or forest, forestry. forestry is evaluated is that possible i think that would make shade on the well no if it's reduced if you're like going down to one little section because the you could you have a whole um north side that is now vacant it can be reforested it, if you do nothing it will reforest i think we can't predict the future we just don't know right but it has to do with the recommi recommissioning and i think plantings can be done that can spur growth sooner but it, if they have solar panels and they're 400 volts, whatever, and then in 10 years they're 500 volts, they're not going to take less to, them down. They're going to put more up. The more capacity, the more money they make. Yeah. Or just replacements there? No. Well, not if their lines only have a capacity of a certain amount. Not if the young. Chris, can you speak to that? I think you're getting um, into things you know that are beyond Actually, the scope. Okay. Right. I'm, I'm absolutely losing control of this meeting. We all know how this is supposed to go. Okay. So, yeah, no. We're, we're, that's, that's outside the scope are of what I think we're going to do. Are you looking for a motion to close the hearing? So, just because it's in, hold on. Just because it's in the decision, I want to make do. sure that we do that by the numbers. But I also don't want to shut down a conversation that is meaningful. But I don't think we're going to tell them how to reforest. No, but I think it should be part of the decommissioning statement, whether it's two words that say that should be considered. So let's just take a straw poll and see if the, you're supported in that on the board, okay? So I'm, an, I'm a no. I'm a no. I'm a no. 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 Okay, so just it, it's not an idea that's going to fly. I appreciate the idea. I think it's too late for that kind of okay. detail, that's all. I think it's a good idea. Um, yes. Sorry. No, no not please. The, I, I just want to go back to the comments that Mr. Zenick had said because yep. those were questions that I had as well um, and over the past many months I've had a lot of conversations with people but a couple of things um, one with regards to preference for defor for for not deforesting land um, you know I, I actually met with Carolyn Dykema to talk to her about that because I was bothered by it as well <laughs> and this is just more for informational purposes but the state actually does provide increased incentive um, when the land is is not um, deforested so um, yes, it's preferential to not deforest, but they've also set up their incentive structure to, to encourage application to other parcels of land. So I just thought that was interesting. Um, secondly, with regards to the, the scenic road, um, and I, I live on a scenic road and I was a sponsor of a scenic road article. Um, the reality of it is that the scenic road protects the right of way only. So it, it doesn't actually have any um, impact on, on properties um, <laughs> that are located on the scenic road, but it, it doesn't have any impact on on the land that is not actually part of the right of way. So, and I actually think that they even acknowledged that the the spots that they were looking at for the road access, they're trying to work between the, the significant trees, which um, I, I personally appreciate. Um, and then the third piece, you asked about impact and whether this was neutral. 
Um, again, I've asked the same question and I, I made comment to that in our previous decision and um, several people have reminded me that um, while there may be some negative implications of this for the neighborhood, there are also some positive implications for the town, primarily in the sense of, um, of, uh, of, of tax responsibility that, that is generated from the increased value of the property. So I, I'm not in a position to say whether that, that um, balances out the negative implications or not, and that's not my intent here, but I just, just want to point that out, that that was something that somebody said to me, that there, there actually are some positive ramifications, one being tax and two being um, alternative source of energy that that, that may um, offset a portion of that that negative implication for the neighborhood so I just want to I just want to just you know extend the agony um, <laughs> um, I also wanted to say that um, I also explored this with a lot of people and, and asking and and for me um, if I was able to vote what I wanted to see um, it's entirely different than what I understand I have to consider. Um, I, I find, you know, I'm a big fan of solar too, but I find clear cutting trees to put in solar um, troubling at best. Um, I asked Elaine this week, in fact, about um, when we went to the, pan to uh, actually when we were interviewing um, candidates, um, I understood that there's a way to, um, to keep solar out of certain districts, and I asked her about that, and what the problem, out of residential districts, and the problem that was explained to me was that we don't then have enough property to zone the playing boards. It was considered during the, the adoption of that bylaw, um, and I think that, I just throw this out there to the Zach, that it's, that it's time to consider um, possibly at least certain residential zones um, or certain areas that um, solar is specifically not desirable um, and certain zones, and, and it will be a difficult conversation to have certain residential zones or zones that it would be more desirable. But it might be time to have that, very, that next level um, difficult conversation, and I don't know if it is or not, I'm just saying, um, where we actually want to see solar develop. Point of order? Okay. Yeah. Um, we left off with Mary's motion, to, and I don't, I don't know if we voted on it to include a recommendation. Thank you. I will get back to that. Excellent point. Just, really fast. I just wanted to say, as, as uh, Chairman of the Board of Assessors, it's not a, a, a done deal tax-wise. And in some places, it's not a very good tax-wise. They're waiting for, between the state and, the, and one of the towns to take it to the SJC because they're exempting a lot of these things. So it's not a done deal to say we're going to get big commercial taxes from these properties. Some of the smaller ones, the state has said. Okay, it's good information to have. And it's, like I said, it's not a done deal. The assessors are taxing them. And, uh, but eventually there's going to there's gonna be a case between the assessor, uh, the towns and, and SJC to see just how much they can tax these. Right now it's full taxation, but it's changing. So. Just clarification, Madam Chairman, yes. on two points. Number one, do we need to determine at this point which entrance they're going to take so A, B, or C? I actually, oh, I think that that's going to be part of the, the conditions. Perfect. I, I, I believe. The waiver. We should, whether it's a waiver or not, yeah. yes. Right, right. So that, yes. that, and then the second piece is, the additional, I think Gary brought it up, uh, it was talked about with the attorney about the additional funds for screening on both yep. Mr. Shambo's yep. property as yep. well as 16. So, is yep. that I totally have a note on that too. Perfect. Thank you, Thank yep. you ma'am. Um, so, it's late. Process wise, the decision from the um, courts does suggest that we close the public hearing. And that is uh, beneficial in two reasons. We comply with the court's decision, always a plus. <laughs> um, and we can also um, postpone our deliberations to a time when we have the time to fully deliberate and take the vote. And that is what is imminently clear we must do. So if we are ready to take a vote to um, close the public hearing, I will entertain that motion. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion on that? To clarify for yep. the public, the public will no longer be able to speak, but we will be able to deliberate? Right? We will deliberate. Okay. We will take no further information from anybody okay. at, at that point. 
We will deliberate. Okay. No That's new information. And we won't bring new information to the table, but we'll deliberate with the information that we have. Okay. Fair. All those in favor <clears throat> signify by saying aye. 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 What are we voting on? Close Closing the public, the public hearing. hearing. Okay. Sorry. That's all. I thought we already did. Go ahead. Yep. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? You, you can't vote, Frank. Okay. Abstaining. Okay. Um, oh, I gotcha. Um, okay, so we are going to have to deliberate at a future meeting. Is there a time that we can tell people we're going to be doing so that? Question, can I ask a question about that? Yep. You, you wouldn't like to start deliberating and see? Nope, we have other business we have okay. to do in the next four minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> if you'd like to review the agendas, we can do that offline and you can pick the time. Just, oh, that's fine, we can do that? Okay, uh, okay. Hmm. I'm just, a little troubled by that because we have so much community investment. I just have a question with regards to deliberation. Is because we are not voting, are we exempt from deliberating or can we partake in deliberation? So, no, you're only prevented from voting. You can still participate in the deliberation. Okay. Okay. All right. Is, is there is there any room on the next agenda? I don't know. You were at six thirty. Prevented from voting because of a conflict of interest or something like that. For the purpose of the model. I hate you. <laughs> is, is there any option to continue on tonight? Uh, there. I, I really. I really don't. I, we can. No, we're supposed to be out of this building by 10, 10. Pretty soon they're going to fire me, and I'm no longer going to be I, I realize that we've already, we've already pushed out public hearings. We've got a lot of deadlines. We've got a lot on our plate. To me, it's either a function of we're going to have to have a special I'll meeting. Ask, I'll ask or, Mrs. Lazarus how she feels about it. <laughs> so at your next meeting, you have a hearing at 730, and that's um, 76 Main Street Marketplace. Yep. At 8.30, you have the continued zoning articles for a half an hour. At 9 o'clock, you have Buckland Leonard. Uh, until 9.30, and you've tentatively scheduled Wilson Street drainage discussion at 9.30. So through so the nice chair. We could meet earlier than Sounds like there's some interest in continuing tonight. Can we just take a little straw poll or something? Are we able to stay until they kick us out and turn out the lights? Um, somebody would have to bodily carry you out, I suppose. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. How fun is that? Well, so I just don't know what other business we're neglecting. So we are. We have two A and R plans that have been uh, postponed, and the applicants are here for those, so and they've been postponed be quick, an hour. Right? It should be quick. Oh, that should be quick. That's cute of you to suggest. I don't know necessarily know <laughs> that that's the case. Did you read your packet? <laughs> it's <laughs> an A and R. There's two of them, and there's a lot of detail in your packet about those A and Rs, but. Can we have the first A and R forward? And I have lost. The, I hope they're quick, Dave. To your to your point. So we need to make a motion for the. The B Street. Uh no, we've we've closed public hearing, no, so we're fine. good. We can deliberate as we see fit. Um, for the rescheduling. Say that, no, we're not rescheduling yet. There's some enthusiasm for. Pushing on. Pushing on, which it's I don't still on this today's I don't agenda. Can I keep I'm sorry, I have lost my agenda. Number five. Okay. You want to use this one? Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, number five, approval not required, 9B Street. Could we have the applicant for that? New Bridge Investments. New Bridge Investments. Is the applicant here? I told you it would be quick. <laughs> Definitely be quick. Okay. Well, would you help us with that, Mrs. Lazarus? So this plan doesn't create any new, new lots. It just defines two existing lots on B Street. So it's entitled to endorsement. And neither of them would comply with the frontage requirements in the zoning district where they are. But they currently exist that way in their grandfather. Ah, thank you. That was the piece. Sounds good. That was the piece that I needed to understand. Okay. How many signatures do you need? Yeah, wait, we need we there's a vote, vote. that needs vote. to happen. Technically, you don't have to vote, but I I'll, So I would make a motion to approve of the approval not required plan for 9B Street. Is there a second? Second. second. Um, all those in, uh, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> okay, on to the easy one. Approval not required 10 Linden Street, and we do have folks here for that. Okay. Well, by the size of that packet, this might not be a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> Some light reading. A lot of pictures. Good evening, folks. Joe Bakuda, joined by Peter Mezzett, owner of number uh, 10, Linden Street. Um, 
Peter and his wife own um, a 4.6 acre parcel on the south side of Linda Street, a private way. And what Peter hopes to do is to create, in essence, number 12 Linden Street. Create a new lot at the end of his frontage um, that uh, would have uh, 234 feet of frontage and 2.66 acres approximately. We'll leave number 10 with the existing home at the 150 foot minimum and uh, 1.94 acres. The existing home is on the um, most innermost portion? Pardon me? The existing home is as the north. further in? I'm sorry, I should wear glasses. The existing home is, is to the westerly side of the boundary of the wall that would become the new boundary line okay. between the parcels. And, and Peter will take the easterly portion and construct a new home. Is that lot four? That we're, okay. Yes. Okay. So that's the new lot. Yes, correct. All right. Yes, Mrs. Lazarus. Any input beyond what we have already been given or any insights? Nothing new to add from what is written in my memo to you, that the board has, um, should ask about access to the lot and mm -hmm. needs to make a determination as to whether it's sufficient to provide adequate access. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would the driveway be where the garage area is or was? Or? There currently is a gravel driveway that accesses uh, Peter's current home with a short turnaround beyond uh, the stone wall, so slightly east. What Peter would, would propose is to extend that driveway into lot four and then create a turn of, turnaround that would be sufficient for uh, the fire chief to uh, be able to turn emergency vehicles around and leave the site. The driveway is paved up to uh, number eight. Mr. Siopa, we, we are proposing, and we are currently before the Conservation Commission with a proposal to pave that the entire way uh, from the existing pavement to the end of the future turnaround. So we will have a 12-foot wide driveway with a two-foot clear shoulder in accordance with regulations that uh, uh, the fire department has promulgated and we'll, we feel we'll be in uh, compliance with those regulations and have a sufficient way to reach our parcel and provide emergency vehicle access. Can, can you draw, just show me how that's going off with your finger? Because I think you lost me oh. <clears throat> on where the driveway was going, I'm sorry. So. I, I yeah. think we could all if you benefit if you just maybe place it if up you on put the board. It, the, yeah. the camera okay. would. No? Okay. Oh, there you go. Peter's existing home is here. The end of the existing asphalt is here at number eight. There's a gravel driver to this location here. Mm -hmm that feeds Peter's existing paved driveway, accesses his home in the rear. What we're proposing is to extend that, not only to provide access into lot four, but then a short distance here, provide a turnaround for the fire vehicles. And because maintenance has become an issue in Peter's time down there since 2000, what we're proposing is to take out the gravel drive, extend it, and then pave it to the end here. At the end of the turn around with emergency vehicles. And has the chief looked at it in terms of whether or not he can <laughs> we be able to access everything you need to with their plan? Have you looked at it? Sorry. There's just a few questions on, on the driveway uh, when it turns from pavement to gravel. Um, so I just have questions that you're going to be able to meet the width that we're talking about. Um, and then the turnaround that he indicated as a driveway looks sufficient, but again, I gotta kind of, I'm trying to piece it through all the pieces of access. It's kind of complicated coming off of the paved part of the Linden as challenging as a driveway. So I'm just looking, I haven't seen a plan yet that shows that the fire truck has all the clearances and makes it through yet. I've met with Joe once looking at the drawings, so I'm kind of watching 
seeing what the end game is. Just a question for Elaine. Yep. Um, they they can't build on that property. I mean, we could divide the the lot, but they can't build on it unless they can have adequate access to it. Is that correct or is that incorrect? I think you would not endorse the plan if you don't find that the 12 foot wide driveway provides adequate access. So if you endorse the plan, you're saying it adequate, that there is adequate access and they could build on it. So really it's also an extension of Linden Street, isn't it? I mean, is it a uh not a public way at that point where the gravel is. It's not it, a public way. No. no. Right. So. Uh, so this would improve it for fire access. Um, but. There's also, I think, a, is there additional land on the other side that someone could subdivide as well, and use. On the normally side, uh, the the reardons have access to Linden Street. I think the issues they have, the hurdles will be more environmental. There's uh, bordering vegetative wetlands that is related to an intermittent stream channel that runs parallel with Linden Street right through here. So their obstacle will be obtaining permits to cross that stream channel. But yes, the railings do have, do have permits on Linden Street. How they Actuate that process. I, I don't know. What can I ask? The important to say beyond here, there's nothing. And beyond is no, the end, end, end of the world. What's it's a slow way, and then it's Fairview Estates and Okay. Amy? I'm just wondering if we can vote to endorse on the conditions that it meet the fire department standards. Like, and if, if since it's approval not required, what happens if we don't endorse it? Doesn't, right? Um, and it's going to have to meet the conservation re commission's restrict rules, right? Regardless. Right, regardless, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, so what does happen if we were not to approve it? It's a good, great question, actually. So, if you don't think that the twelve-foot-wide driveway provides adequate access, the alternative would be for them to submit a plan to construct it to something that is adequate. So the question, if I may, through the mm -hmm. chair. It goes back to the chief. Is the 12 feet adequate, or do they need something larger than the 12 feet? So, because the proposal right now is for 12 feet, correct? Yeah, 12 feet are, is a challenging term. So, if you go to the by, driveway bylaw, it's 12 foot of actual travel way with two foot of shoulder on either side for 16 feet, 13 feet six inches high. That's so it's a box. Again. And then, if there's any corners or obstacles. They have to demonstrate with a swept path analysis or the template that my vehicles will make it around. You know, so there's a few variables. That's a driveway. Um, if it becomes, so we're talking about one or two homes. Yeah. If it's more than one or two homes, then like some of the other examples, then we're talking about a street and we should be talking about more variables. 20 so feet, right? Then it changes so, the dynamic. But we can only address what's in front of us. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, so from a process perspective, can, can we recommend that they withdraw work with the fire department to ensure that it meets their standards and then resubmit or can we approve on good faith that they will work with just what Amy suggested with, with the condition no, not, a condi not even yeah. a condition Amy said never mind the good I don't, I don't think you <laughs> I don't think we know condition. what conditions are made can we put, approve it with a condition that the driveway has to meet the uh, yep. I, I don't know how that would work. I, <laughs> That's a no. You're, you're essentially delegating your your authority to make the finding to the chief. That's not so, don't really you, I would think we would all have confidence that the builder would work with the fire department to make sure that the home can be accurately serviced. You also should consider precedent as well. Yeah. I, I would be inclined to um, stand with Gary and ask them respectfully to return when they can show to the fire department that it will provide adequate access for the properties that you're looking at. So I just ask that I don't get stuck between the, um, <laughs> <laughs> the decision of whether it's a driveway or a road. I've, I've made the driveway by a lot of help with driveway and get safe access. I don't want to. Tell them that's the um, width of we, Linden Street. We had a similar example with Montana um, where we talked about a property that we were just working on a driveway. 
but we also talked about Montana that there's the potential for further development down below. And I talked to the board and I said I'd love to have you uh, evaluate the risk of future developments when we're accepting all of this off of really narrow accesses. Right. So right. when we're talking about just a driveway, it kind of keeps me focused okay. on my drive on the driveway so, by the right. so, so Chief, road. to be clear, this is this is not going to be evaluated as a driveway. It needs to be evaluated as a road. So I think it's a different story than and that's where I'm always, I think the access question becomes greater because of the potential to add more units if it's a road. And uh, I always, in the roadway, we're evaluating water, whether there's a fire hydrant within 500 feet, uh, adequate water supply. These are all questions that, that I run into on a roadway decision. So I think we should get into that conversation. So it From cannot be a driveway to, to do the ANR. Well, it has to be. It's a road that provides legal frontage to the lot. Okay. So the Linda Street yeah. side. So yeah. it has to be a road. It has to be. Yeah, what we're proposing yeah, is a drop. It look like what you think is appropriate for adequate access, but it's a road. Okay. What we're proposing is a travel way that meets the standards of the fire chief with regard to surface width, grade, all those issues that we have kicked around um, from both sides of this argument for a couple of years now. The uh, reason we settled on the 12 and thought it was sufficient is we didn't see any more development on the southerly side, on Peter's side, and very little chance of development on the northerly side given the environmental regulations. And leading up from Curtis Road, which is the access which Linden Street is going to reach, we measured Curtis Road in three different locations. Linden Street. Uh, Linden Street, excuse me, at Curtis Road, three different locations. Uh, about uh, 50 feet east of Curtis, it's 12 foot wide. At number four, Linden Street is 12 foot wide, and at number eight, it's 13 foot wide. We struggle with how do we provide something that is 16 to 18 foot wide, whatever that number is, choose that number, and we get beyond our frontage, and we funnel right back down to 12 foot wide. So we felt the 12 was consistent with what was happening throughout the length of the industry. So the clarity, Ms. To the Chair, Ms. Marconon, those houses are pre-existing and, and that is a, a small way, but it is, it is a road. Um, in the property that we're looking at, is there, is it 18 feet for a, a legal road that's needed? Uh, yeah. It's not tired. Is, I, I believe there is that, but there's not a plan for it right now. 20 feet. Is that correct? Is it's sufficient 20. width, is that what you're yeah. asking? The sufficient width, the 33 foot wide way across the frontage of, of Peter and Karen. Because right now, there is also the aspect of it could be a, a road to nowhere because this would be the modern section of it because that's our modern requirement. But then the rest of the Linden Way is small windy way. Even though it's straight, it's, uh, it's windy. We've tried to anticipate concerns so we have a turnout that would allow for vehicles to pass. In one short section, we widen it out to 16 foot wide so that vehicles can pass, but we don't anticipate a lot of traffic in this section. Simply be the Mesits and whoever buys number 10. So we have tried to, uh, I guess, foresee some of the, the stumbling blocks that, that may pop up. And the other half of that, quite frankly, is the concerns. I, I don't want to play this game. I don't want to pit one board against the other. But there is a concern at conservation that we maintain enough distance off of their wetlands, the, the stream channel and the BBW. On the other that, side. That on, the, on the northerly side, that on this side of the table says, keep it narrower. I mean. Through the chair? Yes, Perry. Um, the plans that we received in our packet <coughs> do not show the turnaround that you're referring to. And there aren't any wetlands. And I, you know, I know you have additional plans there, but um, from what I'm reviewing here from the packet that we received, um, it doesn't seem like it contains the, the details that you're talking about verbally. Mm -hmm. And so I don't see how I could approve that. 
So I, I really just, I mean, from my perspective, I, I would need to see the, what you're proposing and that it is laid out in the plan. So decision is due by April 9th. So I, in order to have an approval not required plan, you have to have a road. So Frontage, area and reasonable access. Okay. We have so with, an area we're debating reasonable we, access. Yes, which means a road. A road. Can you walk us through what that means to you for evaluating it as a road? And I know you're on the spot here, Chief, so as best as you as able to. No, I mean, my mindset is we would start from my foundation is some of the town bylaws and some of what I understand is a best practice for access. So I'd like to know whether we have any ability to widen the, the piece that the uh, owner has. Do we have any ability to do any work on Linden Street? Mm -hmm. uh, if we don't, and then you're evaluating, okay, what are some of the fire protection alternatives? This is a discussion you can have, in my view. You can talk about whether, um, can they run a water main down the road is one of the conversations we have. I don't know whether mm -hmm. they can or not. So it's absent that ability. If you can't do those things, then, um, have a cul-de-sac at the end of the road is normally what we would do. If we can't do that, then we enter into other conversations. So we might talk about whether they apply uh, pull-offs like the driveway um, bylaw has, whether they consider residential sprinklers in the home, so that I don't have to worry about getting as many pieces of equipment in. Hopefully, in the interest of public safety, it has controlled itself better. The ambulance obviously has better access than a fire truck does. Uh -huh. um, you, and, and you can start to calculate out what is a reasonable safety alternative based on the whole picture. Right now, I'm having trouble understanding just what the plan is going right. to be, so I hesitate saying. No, I appreciate that. Position. I appreciate that. Um, I, personally, I would really appreciate if uh, you took the time to work with the fire chief and come back with something that um, is, uh, is, in my opinion, actionable from an ANR perspective. Um, and I don't want to be. I'm not trying to be obstructive or overly difficult either. I get it that you're going to have one more house there, and there really isn't room for another one. Um, but I don't. I think you've heard the conversation. We can't really, we can't really decide it differently than the rules. Um, so it does need it does need to be evaluated as a road, um, and uh, I think that there is certainly room for uh, conversation and, and, and work, but we need to be able to do that. Um, and we don't have a, to Mary's point, um, a, you know, a plan would help us too, so we see it, but that you'd need that for the fire chief, I think. Um, we certainly, I think I can, I, well, I'll speak for myself, we want to find a way to make this work. It just doesn't seem like it's, it's uh, actionable for us tonight. If I could just offer one last piece, so one sticking point that people focus on that I don't know how to solve necessarily is right when it goes from the paved part of Linden to the yeah. dirt part. There's a, there's a challenging swing there and there's some beautiful trees and I know what that does. So there's a real hard calculation there. Seriously, um, Chief? I, I Didn't you have, well, look I, at the time. I'm just telling you that part, <laughs> of, part of working that yes. out in the back room, I'm yeah. not, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, yeah. So, Okay, I appreciate so, that. I appreciate knowing that ahead of time. So as a suggestion, hearing that, when they come back and they, they perhaps outline the trees, that were, might be an issue on the plan? Yeah, totally. You know, totally. I know it's, it's more work than you want, wanted to do for the a and yeah. but we need to have something that is truly actionable. Okay. Okay. Yep. When, no, it, it have, we can wait till the next meeting. So we have a meeting on the 8th. That's what I thought. Okay. All right, so we need to put it on for the 8th. Perfect. Yeah, Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I Thanks. appreciate your patience, too. I know you waited a long time to have this disappointing conversation. Okay. Anybody want to nominate somebody for the Trails Committee that we have been ignoring? I was going to mention, I think more people applied to be on it than the select were able to appoint. So if no one on this committee was interested, maybe some of those other applicants? I don't know. You have potentially done more than the rest of us. Is that true that there was one person? 
I'm sorry, I can't hear any of the trails. I know, but what's the conversation? Sorry, the selectmen appointed several people for the trails committee, and more people applied than there were spots. So, I mean, if somebody on this board wants to be on it, I think that's great. But if not, there might be a, someone from the public. Bodies. Do we know who applied that what didn't get the spot? It's a resident of Blackthorn Circle. The dog park. The dog park spot. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Can I, can I nominate Fran? Do you, know? <laughs> I, you know, I had that thought too as I was an coming. Avid, avid runner. And you are soon no. to be shed That's of right. your responsibilities I, I to the planning board. Is that the 58 How days? Much who's we counting? I love knowing we had Fran in there to count us. You're running? Okay. I'm out. What do they meet? Once a month or two weeks? Uh, once every six months? I'm in. Meet a level <laughs> voice. Do you know they're meeting? I don't know. How often do they meet? Have, uh, they met once and they have another meeting scheduled. Um, Maybe it's next week. Really? I think that That's they are true. establishing how they're going to um, be set up and operate. It's a brand new committee. Yeah. So okay. as much as I would love to oh. do it, I we're gonna vote you in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> if it turns on, out Fran. it's like monthly, I could because I have that. So here's the job. thing. Here's the thing. I, I appreciate that you, you step forward, and I would like to suggest that we appoint you. We can always change that if it turns out that you are not able to. I'm good with that. Is that okay? Yes. I'll entertain a motion <laughs> to appoint Dave to the Trails Committee on behalf of the Planning Board. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No, just kidding. <laughs> Thanks, just, thank you very much for that. And just keep us, keep us informed on how yes. that goes. I appreciate thank that. Thank you for being vulnerable. All right. Okay. Well, be mindful of the hour. Um, we are back to the decision-making process for the um, TJ Solar. <coughs> um, I'm just asking for clarification. And, you know, he's here, but uh, if we picked option B and we do not have to waive the buffers, that first one goes away entirely. Is that correct? Uh, the first waiver. First waiver. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. The first, the first waiver. Okay. So we should decide if we are um, A, B, or C as a as a as an approach, primarily. I, I've heard a number of Bs. I haven't heard any alternatives amongst the board. A is the existing proposal, mm -hmm. which would require some a waiver at at the connection point or for some distance at the road. Right. Um, I, I preferred that, but I am amenable to B if it um, avoids the 75. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. I'm a B. Mary. B. 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 Okay. So let's, um, let's just mandate that it's option. Oh, B. I'm sorry. <laughs> you see. On this you get the majority. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I get. Okay. I get. All right. Option no, B. I get all kinds. Of all right. So option B okay um, will require that the applicant come back to us for the scenic road um, permit, right? Yeah. Um, but we no longer have to waive um, the buffers around the residential uses. Mm -hmm. Um, zoning bylaw section 210-203.D, approval criteria. Before the board may issue a special Is permit, it shall determine each of the following. The commercial solar photovoltaic installation conforms to the provisions of this article, i.e. Article 31. Um, Mr. Zadig brought that. I want to make sure I make the point that I reviewed that today, today myself. Um, that the commercial solar vo photovoltaic installation will not be detrimental to the neighborhood or the town, um, and environmental features of the site and surrounding areas are protected, and specifically surrounding areas will be protected from the proposed use by provision of adequate surface water drainage. I just wanted to note that the board already uh, issued a stormwater management permit for this Yes, project. thank you. So that has been done. Um, so um, it is incumbent upon us to determine that we have determined that um, adequate surface water drainage is, in, is has been accounted for. Uh, the, that the commercial solar photovoltaic installation conforms to the provisions of Article 31 of the Zoning Bylaw. Article 31 of the Zoning Bylaw. Um, 
uh, allows for the development the, the the photovoltaic installations by special permit. Um, the construction and use of a commercial solar photovoltaic installation or any part thereof shall be permitted in any zoning district subject to the requirements set forth in this section. Nothing in this article should be construed to prevent the installation of solar photovoltaic installations that are permitted as of right. Okay, that doesn't that doesn't apply. Um, shall uh, commercial solar photovoltaic installations shall conform to the following provisions. A commercial solar photovoltaic installation may be erected upon the issuance of a special permit on a lot containing a minimum of three acres. All the set by guard, buffer, and screening requirements applicable in the zoning district in which the installation is lo located shall apply. So those both are true. All security fences surrounding the installation shall be set back from the property line a distance equal to the setback requirement applicable to buildings within the zoning district in which the installation is located. That is also true. <clears throat> the provisions of Article 20 site plan review shall not apply to commercial solar photovoltaic installations. The visual impact of commercial solar photovoltaic installations, including all accessory structures and appurtenances, shall be mitigated. All accessory structures and appurtenances shall be architecturally compatible with each other whenever reasonable structures shall be shielded from view by vegetation and or joined and clustered to avoid adverse visual impacts. Methods such as use of landscaping, natural features, and fencing may be utilized. So we need to be sure we address that in a decision if we approve it. Lighting shall not be permitted. I don't think that's an issue. All utility connections from the commercial solar photovoltaic installation shall be underground unless otherwise specifically permitted, specifically permitted otherwise by the planning board in the special permit. Um, electrical transformers and inverters to enable utility interconnections may be above ground if required by the utility provider. Remind me, are, is that going to be above ground or, oh, I can't take information from the board. That's going to not be above ground, right? Are those the cabinets? The cabinets are above ground. Is that electrical transformers and inverters are the cabinets? So they will be above ground? That yes. They will need to be, be specifically um, on a cement platform. Shielded, right? Six by eight, three feet high. Um, okay. Clearing of natural vegetation shall be limited to the minimum necessary for the construction, operation, and maintenance of the commercial solar photovoltaic installation except as otherwise prescribed by applicable laws, regulations, and bylaws or the special permit. The commercial solar photovoltaic installation owner or operator shall maintain the facility in good condition. Maintenance shall include but not be limited to painting, structural repairs, continued compliance with landscaping and screening requirements, and integrity of security measures. The owner or operator shall be responsible for the maintenance of any access uh, roads serving the installation. I think that that is accounted for. Uh, is that specifically accounted for in the decision um, conditioning um, the screening that it's maintained over time? I think the board would go through those conditions. Oh, so I, I think we need to pay attention to that too. Um, just trying to read what is required. So we have the authority to make to waive specific provisions. Um, this is in the administrative section. Um, conduct its review, hold a public hearing, file its decision as required. Um, approval criteria. So we we already know we have to decide that it conforms to the provisions of this article. Um, will, will not be detrimental to the neighborhood or the town. The environmental features of the site and surrounding areas are protected. Specifically, surrounding areas will be protected from post use. We, we talked about that. Um, so we can impose conditions. Um, and then it, it uh, accounts for what has to happen when the solar uh, insulation is discontinued and we need to talk about that as well in our conditions. <coughs> so here comes the fun part. We need to determine that the commercial solar photovoltaic installation conforms to the provisions of this article, Article 31 of the Zoning Bylaw 
um, commercial solar, solar photovoltaic installations, which we just talked about. Um, we are prepared to condition as necessary uh, for visual impacts, um, <coughs> for maintenance of the landscaping, and for um, screening of the electrical transformers and inverters to, en to, uh, to enable the connection. And wildlife passage, wildlife. correct? Is, that's not that part of okay. this, but Got it. That, is still, okay. that is still something we have. So we are just finding that they have satisfied um, Hopkins and Zoning Bylaw Chapter 31. But we can, part, part and parcel of that administratively is we can impose conditions that are necessary. Was Mary's right. condition included in that? It will be. It Mary will be the conditions. conditions. It will yeah. be. Yeah. Right. We're not to the conditions. So. Yes. Help me out. Logically, it would make sense for you to defer action on the finding on A until you've approved the conditions. Because you, you can't really say it, that it satisfies the requirements unless you know what the conditions are. Can we uh, agree as a board to add that condition? Add which condition? That it, when you were talking, I'm sorry. <laughs> which, which one are you speaking to? I'm speaking to finding A, a commercial solar voltaic, photovoltaic installation conforms to the provisions of this article. Oh, thank you, okay. And I'm and saying logically. Yep. You should first agree on what the conditions all are. And then come back to that. And then come back to that. And okay. truly, that's going to be true about B as well. I mean, probably all of them. So it makes sense to do the conditions first. Conditions, conditions first now. and come back. Okay. Um, and is that also true for zoning bylaw section 210-223? All applicable criteria and standards set forth have been satisfied. I imagine it, mu it must be the same. Please, so. it makes sense to do the conditions first. Okay, let's do the conditions first. <laughs> if only I could find the conditions. So, before you begin. Yes, please. Can I just make a suggestion that you just announce to the public that we have 25 conditions and just count, number them off when, as you go, please? But that wouldn't be too much. Trouble. Yeah, I just have to find them again. I'm trying there to see. Are, uh, oh my on. god, I am way past that. Oh, yes. I have them here. Thank you. I can't see it anymore. I'm, I do have some extra <laughs> I'm going to start to hallucinate, to be honest <laughs> with you. Uh, pass them out. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that isn't a bad idea for us to have them. Yeah. I've got them on. Yeah. I've got them on my computer. Those with the meeting minutes that are have screens, it's page 30, 31. People with screens are not okay with that. I'm sorry, I did not hear you. Paid people that have screens, it's 29, 29 Thank 31. You. Yes. Um, okay, so um, condition number one. The vegetative planting shown on the submitted landscape plan dated August 20th, 2018, revised through September 25th, 2018, shall be completed concurrently with the installation of the solar facility with the exception that if the facility is constructed in the winter months, planting may be deferred to the beginning of the next growing season. I believe that would be revised through mm -hmm. March 21st, 2019. 25th. Thank you. There was a new landscaping yeah, plan submitted. So today, that's, that's exactly right. Thank you. March 25th, 2019. And how do we add in the screening for the Hanowitz? Um, so I, I suggest we do a separate um, condition for the Hennewich and the uh, what we will now be adding back in for Shambos if we decide to do that. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Do we want to add um, that there is um, that there is a condition that it is maintained for the life of the project, as we were talking about it from the bylaws? Isn't there something later? Is Just there already? Yeah. yeah, I think Again, there is. I lose my. All right, so we'll hold on to that, okay? Yep. All right, number two, prior to the start of planting installation, the wetland scientist or landscaped architect <coughs> shall meet with the homeowner of 15 Wilson Street and the principal planner to coordinate the installation of plantings that are proposed 
on the property at 15 Wilson Street as shown. Um, and I think that that condition changes. This is August 20th through September 25th. Um, and the applicant no longer proposes to do that, but we are contemplating a condition that there's at least a single row. So I'm gonna cross that one out. Unless you want to modify that to be the one, the one you were talking about. Um, Um, so, uh, I'm fine doing that. So I would propose, um, that we, can we put both properties in there? Sure. Okay. So I would propose that we, um, we modify it prior to the start of the plant, of planting installation, the wetland scientist or landscape architect shall meet with the homeowner of 15 Wilson street and the principal planner and 14 Wilson Street, I don't help me out there, to coordinate the installation of plantings that are uh, required or whatever word that is as part of this decision. Um, so um, a single row along the fence is what uh, Mr. Shambo asked for um, and he would make additional plantings. Um, and then I heard the attorney for the applicant say that typically you might set aside um, some money to make sure that that was done. And you, and I think he said a thousand dollars. So up to a thousand dollars per, per home. Per, um, I'm only on fifteen, right? Um, how how long are you talking about here in terms of screening? I'm just not sure a thousand dollars is sufficient is adequate that's how long are we talking about uh, i can't we can't take yeah. information it was on the it was on the west side yes anybody anybody get their their plan the up <clears throat> so should we just should we just say up to uh, just ask for up to twenty five hundred dollars and hope that they can be frugal for themselves i don't think that's unreasonable is that is that okay twenty five hundred each yes yeah. okay yes up to. Up to. All right, so I guess we don't even necessarily have to um, detail out the single row. Mr. Shambo can speak to that himself. Yeah. But plantings as appropriate and um, agreeable to the homeowners up to $2,500 worth to um, bolster the screening between those two properties and the yeah, solar it's installation. Yeah, generic like that. Yeah, yeah. I did not write that all down. I'm counting on Kobe. <laughs> we'll wordsmith these later. Magic. Okay. Um, number three, prior to planting, the specific placement of screening planting shall be determined by a qualified wetland scientist or landscape architect to maximize screening effectiveness and ensure successful establishment of plantings. Do you mind if I go back to the previous one? I so do not. With regard to 14, Wilson? Yeah, it's going to be the same. I'm sorry. In, in that whole thing, we can sort of change both. it. So both properties, 14 and 15 Wilson Street, um, as amenable to the property owners, up to $2,500 to screen. Okay. Sorry. That was my entirely my fault. All right, number three. Does anybody have any issues with number three? Nope. Okay. Number four. Following planting, the effectiveness of the installed screening shall be reevaluated during the non foliar season by a qualified wetland scientist or landscaped architect. Areas where additional screening is required shall be identified as screening shall be installed in said identified areas. A report detailing the evaluation shall be submitted to the board for review and approval. Uh, on behalf of the uh, number five, on behalf of the applicant, the Narragansett Tribe of Rhode Island and the Wampanoag Tribe of Aquina, Aquina, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, will complete a survey to identify the features and any associated alignments within the areas of potential effect of any cultural and or historical resources and to determine what impact avoidance plan will be necessary. Is uh, the impact avoidance plan, so I didn't sit through the first set of hearings, is that an identified term that has a meaning in the report that you received? Uh, so that's a really great question, and I would hate to lie to you. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm not sure. I think that the, they were the. I know that the work was ongoing to to um, to create that plan. I, I 
feel like in my mind it's a it's a plan that we're coming up with. Um, Excuse me. Yes. I'm over here. So thank you. I didn't know who was calling to me. <laughs> Ghosts. I, I'm not sure I understand the last sentence of number four. A report detailing the evaluation shall be submitted to the board for review and approval. So this is a this is the effectiveness of the installation screening will be reevaluated and a report will be submitted and that's it. Yeah, right. So there should be some uh, mechanism for corrective action as necessary. That's what it seems like. Mm. Um, I am so open to some words. Well, should we just switch your order those two sentences? Number four. We're back to number four. Yeah, so you say your report dealing the evaluation shall be submitted, and then right before that, areas where additional screening is required shall be identified and installed, right? Shall mm -hmm. be installed mm -hmm. in said identified area, yeah. yeah is that okay if we swap the sentences? <laughs> Do you need to report that? Listen. Well, yeah. yeah uh, I think you need to report it. I mean, yeah. Uh, otherwise, your, the requirement that they um, provide additional screening um, doesn't have any actual basis if there isn't a report for that calls for it. And we've seen the screening is not effective. So, so the other one. So just take those three sentences, take the third sentence and make it the second sentence. Right. Okay. Right. right. Perfect. Well, that, well, I, I, I was actually. Words <laughs> this far, so. Nice job. Um, number five is okay. The impact avoidance plan, I'm not sure, is that actually, that is a, I think that's a plan that's evolving, right? That was my understanding that there was more work to be done. I thought they had a plan. They uh, do have a plan, but they were going to work with them, at, they were going to work with them as they were installed, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I, I guess in my head it's a little bit okay. open-ended. But the, the next five conditions are all related to that, so. Yep. Okay. Let's, let's get through five and then see if we need to uh, make any changes. In areas identified as requiring protection, the engineering of the racking systems and associated infrastructure will be designed to protect and preserve the integrity of the identified cultural and or historic resources. A final, number seven, a final engineering plan shall be provided to the planning board and the tribes at least seven days prior to filing for a building permit. Um, Number eight, the tribes or designated representatives will be presented, will be present as construction monitors during the tree clearing to be allowed by hand and installation of racking systems and associated infrastructure for compliance and to identify any petroglyphs, remains, or new cultural and or historic resources to be preserved and protected after the land is cleared. What is that to be allowed by hand? That doesn't make <clears throat> any sense to me. I think the clearing is by hand. Around. I assume that there's some areas where clearing would only be by hand. Yeah, so they don't disturb the rocks. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of nice. It's nice. So, but maybe there's a better way we can be worded. Yeah, it's. it's not yes, very, Carol. A question on eight. What happens if the tribes don't show up? They never get to clear anything or install anything. Mm. We're going to assume say. they're going to show up. We'll be invited. Give them an opportunity to be present. Yeah, okay. that's a pretty good idea. Opportunity. Tribes that it isn't, but but they're expected to be um, notified. No, more than notified. They're expected to be included if they're willing to be included, right? So not just given the opportunity and then oh, well you missed it, right? The expectation is that um, yeah that we want them there and. And they're to be included in that process, right? Um, and not just notified. And I hope you can make it on a, at a particular day and time. Okay. You want to require a tribe or their? Well, see, we said that, and then Carol said, "What if they just don't show up?" We could say something like, "They will be invited." Is there a reasonable effort standard, or? No, you say a reasonable opportunity to be present. Okay. So if we can say anything. Right. Right. <laughs> I think Elaine's going to wordsmith that for us. Um, so I think I that would require numbers. number six, item number six, to include tribes to be participatory in the design of the racking system with engineering. Um, but Elaine can wordsmith that. 
We have <laughs> standard, lucky Elaine. Yeah, no. <laughs> so much confidence in you, Elaine. You just can't even believe how much confidence we have. All right, so I, so I, I, I'm amenable to wording that doesn't like hang anybody up. If, if for some reason. I think we got the gist of all those, yeah. right? And the, yeah. Did you want to put a time limit on, like 60 days or something like that? To... I don't want. No. It, uh, I'm sure. The, I'm sure it won't be a problem. Yeah. Right. They're people of the earth. They're concerned. Um, I, I'm not averse to a time limit. Nobody. Uh, For which one? Uh, I mean, how long eight. should they wait for the Indians to participate? Native Americans. Native Americans. I think I, I don't. I think they're very they're very involved. So I don't. I just don't think it should be. I don't so either. My, but my, my concern with a specific time constraint too is that sometimes just in construction specific, things change, weather right, changes. Right. Right. Like, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's more important that they're you part can predict of the, the contractor when they're yeah. going to show up. A reasonable opportunity. Good. We're back to reasonable mm -hmm. opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, um, notification. Uh, how about yeah? How about something if um, if if uh, if they are not present after a reasonable time that the town is notified that that is going to be the case. So we have an opportunity to at least address it if we're sold. Let's move on. Is that okay? <laughs> I'm good with it. Okay. Everybody else? Um, number nine, the final survey and protection plan shall be provided to the Hopkinton Historic Commission upon completion. Um, I want to add one here um, on decommissioning. I thought that was a yeah, good idea. So this is a, a new number, 9A, say. Um, when a decommissioning, uh, the native structures around where the, well, when decommissioning the solar project, um, the tribes or designated representatives will be notified and given a reasonable opportunity to um, ensure that the, the structures are protected um, during the decommissioning process. Sounds good. Nice. Number 10, the solar facility shall be constructed in conformance with the approved plan, the stormwater management permit, and the order of conditions issued by the Conservation Commission, said order to be enforced by the Hopkinton Conservation Commission. Number 11, the Director of Municipal Inspections will inspect the solar facility's construction and operations for compliance with the special permit. If the Director of Municipal Inspections determines at any time before or during construction that a registered professional engineer or other such outside professional is required to assist with the inspections, the applicant shall be responsible for the cost of those inspections. Number 12, prior to the commencement of construction, the applicant shall submit a detailed performance bond estimate, bond estimate detailing the appropriate cost for pro proper maintenance and or removal of the installation which shall not exceed the estimated cost of the installation's removal for review by the board's engineer. I don't even know if that makes sense. Don't we know how to put an amount in there, too? What's that? Don't we know how to put an amount in there? Uh, it's a performance bond estimate. But what were you going to say, Mr.? I was going to object to the use of and or. Mm. OK. Um, so you want. A co uh, appropriate cost for proper maintenance, and you also want an appropriate cost for removal, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. So yep. you don't want it to be and or, you right. just want it to be and. So but we'll get rid of that or. And I also wondered whether removal is covered by number 14. Yeah. Mm, yeah, specifically covered in number 14, right? So. Why don't we just make that one maintenance? This is just the proper maintenance, and then 14 will be the removal? Yeah. Well. Well. I think that's a no. good idea. Well, they say different because things. Because the, the, the first one is just to provide the estimate. Yeah. Oh, right. And okay. that, that's 12. 14 says to provide the performance bond. But that's only for removal. Is there another one for maintenance? Uh, 
Yeah, 23. Oh, that's for screening. Mm -hmm. And stormwater is 24. 24 is stormwater. So it doesn't seem to be. What else needs to be maintained that the town would have an interest in? 14A. We just modify 14 to say um, performance bond posted, excuse me, shall post a performance bond with the town in an amount equal to the estimated. Can we add, ma can we add maintenance into this one? I think it should keep number separate. 14. Thank you. Yeah, I guess since, since 12 covers both. The estimate, yeah. Since 12 covers the estimate for maintenance and removal of the installation, then 14 is the bond for maintenance and future removal of the installation. So it's clear that, is it clear that when you say proper maintenance that you're referring to proper maintenance of the installation? That's what I'm, I'm understanding. It's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. So reasonable person. Understanding. Shall we that's just write, we're going to write that in there? No, it says, that's no. what it says. Oh, that's what it says, proper maintenance yeah. of you, the installation. Yeah. There was a question about what is, what are you, what sort of maintenance yeah. are you requiring? Okay. Can, on number 12, um, and maybe it's just me because it's getting late, but the which shall not exceed the estimated cost of the installation's removal? I, just does, does not that, make Does the sense. sentence make sense to everybody? Well, if it's not being, if it's not being maintained, my, my, my understanding is that it could, that would cover the cost of removing a, a facility that's not being maintained. It still okay, doesn't so make sense that, to me. What, what I think it's trying to say is, that whatever the estimate for maintenance is, it can't be more than the than the cost of removal. Right. Why? No, it needs to be the cost of removal. It needs to be so that if they're not maintaining it, that you can afford to take it out. That's what I. That's what I thought I just said. Detailing appropriate costs for proper maintenance and. So the removal of the installation. 21 covers the removal. Or. That's why it's right. and or. If, if it's not being maintained, the, yeah. you, can't, you, can't, um, you can't exceed the cost of removing it for, for to hold. So the bond. No. The bond has to come. Bond means to be in the amount of the cost of the removal. In case it's not being maintained and it gets to that point, that it just has to be removed? Is how I sort of yes. understood it. And the bond covers right. that cost. So why do you need a a report detailing the cost of maintenance? So maybe we don't. I'd so that you know how much to make the bond for. Well, the bond, the bond is just removed if they're not maintaining it. Mm -hmm. Cost of the installation's removal. Right. So you need to know what that cost is in order to remove it. So you need to know the cost of the bond, what that's going to be. Yes, which is just the cost of removal. Right. Because if they don't maintain it, then it just gets removed. Right. That's a leap, by the way. But, right? But 20 cents are right. going. <laughs> What's that, Mario? That's a leap. Right. There'd be, yeah. there'd be a whole big argument in, in yes. between. Well, yes. yes. See the estimate. Um, and the town isn't going to go in and maintain it. Right? No. 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 If they deem it not to be, not to be. So we want to cover, we want to make sure we cover the cost of, of removal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you don't need what shall not exceed. You just need the estimated cost of the installation's removal. But 21 also says that if you don't mean, it's not being maintained, it's going to be removed at the owner's, ex at the applicant's expense. Yeah, and 12 is just establishing the bond. But why do you need a, why do you need a bond if it's going to be removed at their expense? In case they don't, they might be out of business. Bond. We'll have the money to pay for it. Shouldn't that be part of 21? 21. Determines for certain that the final How do you get to 21? Shasta, what do you think? Oh, sorry, 20. I do. It's 2020. Yeah, but this, that's if that's if they're they're going to follow the rules, but if they don't follow the rules, then you need to rely on the bond. You keep the money, right? You got to keep some money in your pocket. So that you can drop them up. Mm -hmm. the and then we passed it. Yeah, if they skip time. So 12, is, 12 is just telling them they, you have to tell me how much it's going to cost to get rid of this stuff. And 14 is saying you have to get a bond to cover that cost. Yeah. 
but you need to make sure that it that it is a performance bond guaranteeing maintenance. Because right now, it, it, once you take it, fourteen is um, <coughs> is a performance bond. Doesn't say guaranteeing what in an amount equal to the estimated cost. This is a performance bond that guarantees maintenance and proper removal. Okay. So we can have them both together. Right. We don't need them in separate conditions, but okay. And one, and because. Okay. So just take out or. And so back do to what you originally no, said. No, back what we, have, uh, we, we got rid of estimated dealing, detailing the appropriate cost of removal. That's all we're doing in 12. Okay. Right. So are we covered in 12 and 13 if we 12 estimates the cost of removal and 14 is a performance bond to cover the cost of maintenance and removal? Right. Are we? Well, it, it doesn't get, it's, the amount of the bond is equal to the cost of removal, but the bond in fact guarantees proper maintenance or removal. Because if you pull the bond, right. you're going to use it to remove it. You're not going to use it to maintain it. Got then it. then Got why it. would the bond reference the maintenance? Because if they're not because if they're not maintaining it, then they're in violation of the terms of the bond, and you can pull it. Okay. Thank you. It's clear to me now. So All right. Nice. So number twelve, we simply get rid of the word or. No, we got rid of more than that. Tell me what number twelve says now. This is what I understand. Number twelve says, Elaine, you can and and um, Ray, you can double check that. Prior to commencement of construction, the applicant shall submit a detailed performance bond estimate, deal, detailing the appropriate cost for removal of the installation, for review by the board's engineer. The applicant shall return to the board for approval of the performance bond estimate prior to the commencement of construction. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. And number 14, we, we skipped number 13, but we'll go back to it. Um, so we're just saying in accordance with the provisions of section 203.E, the applicant shall post a performance bond guaranteeing proper maintenance and removal of the facility. in an amount equal to the estimated cost to remove all components. Okay. Number 13, the owner of the property and the owner operator of the solar facility shall have a decommissioning agreement in place for as long as the solar facility is located on the property. Number 15, all signage at the solar facility site must comply with Article 27 of the zoning bylaw and the grant of this special permit is not an approval or authorization of any such on-site signage. Number 16, the operator of the solar facility shall conduct vegetation control on-site. No pesticides, herbicides, or other chemical products shall be used. Vegetation control by mechanical means may occur only between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday through Friday and Saturdays between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. pursuant to Chapter 141, Article 1, of the Town of Hopkinton General Bylaws. The solar facility shall be subject, this is number 17, the solar facility shall be subject to all setback, yard, buffer, and screening requirements applicable in the Agricultural A and Residential A RA districts pursuant to Section 210.202.B of the Zoning Bylaws. Um, I'm sorry. That's okay. You're back on 16? Okay. Um, a caution. If you want to leave it in, be my guest. But a caution, if you ever had to enforce the prohibition against the use of pesticides and herbicides, uh, I'm telling you it would be hard. Um, the state pesticide law has basically preempted your authority to impose that condition. 
So if you want to leave it in, that's fine. Leave it in. Well, I'm just. It's not enforceable. I'm just telling you that if we had to enforce it, we might have some difficulty. I support leaving it in. I think, I think so, too. too. If nothing else, that state guidance might change in the future. In any zone, any district, for any reason? Okay. So that feedback for any, in any zone, near any resource, for any reason, the state? I'm just, well, in another without, town, we're fighting this battle right now, so I maybe we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll carve out a little wiggle room. But um, the first sentence of the State Pesticide Control Act says, this act shall be the exclusive source of regulating use of pesticides. So, um, so anytime that you want to go up against um, uh, in the very first sentence of the statute. Uh, yeah. I Understood. Uh, yeah. so, okay. Can't we make our bylaw say this will be the exclusive? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good luck on that one. Too. So it's not like state and federal government? You no. secede from... Anyway, states. here we go. One question um, on number 17. Okay. Yes. Is there a reason why the industrial B district wasn't listed? Because a portion of it is in industrial B. I'm sure that was an oversight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, number 18, all security fences surrounding the installation shall be set back from the property line at an equal distance to the setback requirements applicable to buildings within the Agricultural A, Industrial B, and Residential A, RA districts pursuant to uh, the appropriate section of the bylaw. So you added you add Industrial B again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Number 19, no lighting shall be permitted at the solar facility site except as required by the Massachusetts State Building Code. All lighting must be directed downward and full cutoff fixtures shall be pursuant to the appropriate sections of the zoning bylaws. Number 20, as required by section 210-202.1 of the so zoning bylaws, the owner or operator of the solar facility shall maintain the facility in good condition. Maintenance is to include painting, structural repairs, continued compliance with the landscaping and screening requirements, and the integrity of the on-site security measures. The owner or operator shall also be responsible for maintaining any access roads serving the installation site. Number 21, if the Director of Municipal Inspections determines pursuant to Section 210-204 of the Zoning Bylaws that the commercial solar photovoltaic Installation has been discontinued. The owner shall remove the installation, including all structures, equipment, security barriers, and tra transmission lines, and stabilize or revegetate the site as necessary to minimize erosion and sedimentation at the owner's sole expense within three months of the receipt of the notice of discontinuance pursuant to that section. Number 22, so, yep, go ahead. So back when we were doing the bond estimate, mm -hmm. we, just said, we just said the cost of removal. Mm -hmm. But in 21, there's more <coughs> to it. There's... Um, revegetation. Stabilizing, removal, revegetating. Right, there's all those things. Yeah, so stable. maybe what so you want to do is you want to... Um, um, re reference 21 and 14. So instead of just say guaranteeing um, a proper maintenance and removal, um, uh, you want to, in addition, say uh, and completion of all the obligations of paragraph 21. You're talking about putting that in 12? Putting that in 14. 14. 14. Can you just copy and paste? Or would you just reference 21? What I was kind of suggesting before is you just combine the two. and <laughs> if, they, if they don't move, if they do not remove it, we'll remove it for them using the mm -hmm. cost. It's cleaner this way. Using the bond. Separated, yeah. What? <laughs> cleaner. 
here's the estimate. She's going to reorder. Yeah, I think they need to be reordered. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe a clarification on what decommissioning is includes in 14. In 13. What? No, 14 also has decommissioning. Decommissioning agreement. Does 12 not need that same reference since 12 is what determines the amount for 14? Yep. Reference 21 and 12 as well? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Maybe there's a way to make one big condition with sub bullets. Yeah, I think that sounds like a great idea. This is why you get sure. Yes. I don't. I don't actually care how you do it as long as it makes sense. Um, I'm sorry. Elaine is is uh, good at wordsmithing. She's the whiz. Yeah, I actually don't know how she does all that she does. With the hours available, number 22, the solar facility shall be maintained in compliance with all noise level requirements under the bylaws and zoning bylaws of the town of Hopkinton. Number 23, prior to any construction or preparation for construction, the applicant owner will provide a surety in the amount of $10,000 to secure future maintenance of the required screening for up to five years. The surety shall be in the form of a perpetual surety bond or buy a deposit of money in the event that the owner does not follow the maintenance procedures or that the screening dies within the five-year period the board shall have the authority to expend any portion of said security for that purpose 24 prior to any construction or preparation for construction the applicant owner will provide a surety in the amount of ten thousand dollars to secure future maintenance of the stormwater management system for up to five years the surety shall be in the form of a perpetual surety bond or by a deposit of money. In the event that the owner does not follow, follow maintenance procedures and programs as approved by the planning board, the board shall have the authority to expend any portion of said security to provide for such maintenance. At the end of the five-year period, the surety shall be renewed for an additional five years. Is that once or forever? Every five years, are you asking? Is that the question? Does it get renewed? Mm -hmm. Does it die at, at, at the end of 10 years? Of 10 keep it going. For the life of the project, I do it for it 10 years. I think it's for the life of the project. That's it, yep. Okay. In perpetuity. Then you get word, rid of the word. As long as it exists. Get rid of an. As long, it, yeah, well, how we're, whatever it makes sense. So it also makes sense to have that same language five years and then renew five, five years in 23 instead of perpetual. Okay. I'm pretty sure that, you, that um, when the time comes, the applicant will tell you that he's unable, that they're unable to get a perpetual bond. Okay. Okay. Um, number 25, catalog cut sheets of all equipment to be installed shall be, be provided to the principal planner for review prior to the pre-construction meeting. Is there a standard of review? Say it again. What is the planner going to be reviewing it for? Completeness or something more? To be consistent with the plan? Consistent with what's been, with what's been approved? Okay. You haven't approved anything? Yeah. Consistent with, with the plan? All right, um, so we, um, uh, the um, number 26, I guess, would be the wildlife corridor. With your Knox boxes? Knox With boxes. my K-N-O-X boxes. Yes, I uh, provided the additional two gates with Knox boxes. Um, do we need to um, specify that we are also choosing option B by condition? Mm -hmm. And was there also placement a of the access or Yes. It? Yeah, with modifications for, for equipment placement and, and screening because the plan now currently shows A. So what they'll have to do is flip it around. So just with modifications and in, in compliance with screening. 
And when we say option B, um, we probably want to note that they need to come back probably for a scenic road. Program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, did we miss anything? Um, screening of the cabinets. Ah, thank you. All right, so 28 would be to mandate to condition screening of the um, trans, whatever they, the cabinets at the connection site on Wilson Street. So so they would, they did, you want it, did you want that to be reviewed? It's that, part of the plans already. The existing right, there's plans? something on there with the boxwoods, you think, and the thought was that may not be. No, but the landscape plan, um, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> refer to the note that says, or something similar? It, it does say that, yeah. Okay. Is that good? Okay. All right, anything else? Um, police detail we mentioned? Do we need to? Uh, I think that yeah, we did mention it. That's in the plan. We can condition it, right? For the period of cons the construction period, there's a poli police deal detail at uh, the applicant's expense on Wilson Street. Well, is it in, if it's in the plan, maybe? Or sometimes okay. they'll meet with the um, public safety departments beforehand and determine if it's necessary. Or do you want to leave it up to them, or do you want to require it? So they they offered that they would do it, and on that stretch of Wilson Street, I I vote for requiring it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. It's dangerous. <clears throat> and is that just on Wilson or on Cedar also? Uh, specifically Wilson Street for me. I think it's Wilson. I think there's enough of a turnoff on Cedar that they're okay. Good. Why don't you put us a condition? They'll confer with the police department to make sure that they have adequate. There. <coughs> yeah. So number 30 is to confer uh, for uh, adequate safety construction on the Cedar Street side? Confirm, I would say just on, for the project. Well, there's, there's gonna be two sides. So Wilson Street, we required a police detail. On Cedar Street, we um, require a conference with the public safety. Mm -hmm. So on the detail on Wilson, yep. so that's at any point during construction or is that when certain things are happening? So uh, I understood it to be for the period of construction. Is that site work? Is that panel delivery, um, installation? See, I would think that implies when they're actually doing work on Wilson Street, when they're <coughs> doing the connection and cutting, I mean. Uh, oh, so if, I understood it when they were bringing on. things in and out in that spot too. Because all the construction, if it takes three months to, to, to construct this, they need a police detail for the three months well so if I don't want to be unreasonable either because if we'll they've have got them confer the with public safety on both sides because um, yeah. I'm sure that that road yeah. they I think that that makes better that. sense to be honest with okay. you because during periods of time when like panels are being delivered or whatever that could very definitely make sense yeah. but when they're installing panels deep inside it doesn't make sense necessarily. is that pretty typical Elaine to work in such a way to confer with so I think when you think there's going to be an issue happening on the street, which would be when mm -hmm. big trucks are coming, mm -hmm. I think that would be, or when they're doing earth removal, if they're doing that, I don't know. That makes sense to me. Not that we put any real words to but it. But didn't, didn't we discuss, didn't we discuss that most of the big work is going to be happening on the Cedar Street side, and they were going to only use the Wilson Street side they the other yeah, because they can't cross yeah. the. They can't, can't cross. cross the They're going to be on both the sides. Yeah. Yeah. They, the they have to enter from both sides. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, we're up to thirty. But actually, probably more than that because we had a nine A. <laughs> Just saying. We might combine. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else? Now we are prepared to do our findings of fact. Special permit findings. Thank you. Good Lord. 
Um, okay, so we're we're back to making sure we reconsider zoning bylaw section 210 121.1, the very first one. We have conditioned that it will be option B that will not require a waiver to the buffers around the residential uses. So we can strike that one. The second one that we have to consider is the zoning bylaw section 210, 203, section point D, um, approval criteria before the board may issue a special permit, it shall determine each of the following. The commercial solar voltaic installation conforms to the provisions of this article, article 31 of the zoning bylaw, commercial solar photovoltaic installations. <coughs> when we went through that, we talked about needing to address um, the visual impacts and screening. We talked about needing to address screening the cabinets that will be on Wilson Street. And we talked about um, maintaining the facility in, in good condition. So I think that we have satisfied those conditions. Um, and, the com and also find uh, that the commercial solar photovoltaic installation will not be detrimental to the neighborhood or the town. So um, I think this is the hard one for most of us. Um, and I think that we are constrained by what is allowed uh, for um, individual property owners. And as much as I, the sentimental favorite for me would be to um, not put an industrial use in a residential neighborhood, I think it is allowed and not considered to be detrimental. I agree. And the, the conditions mitigate many of the items that you've identified, potentially? True enough. Yeah. Hopefully so. Um, the environmental features of the site surrounding areas are protected and specifically surrounding areas will be protected from the proposed use by the provisions of adequate surface water drainage, which is the stormwater plan that has already been approved. So um, I would say that we have satisfied the zoning bylaw section 210, 203.D. Are we agreed? Yes. Would you consider the, the Native American um, items to be part of the environmental features of the site that are protected? Uh, Could be mentioned there. The environmental. Um, and historic or cultural? So this is the zoning bylaw language. It, it speaks to me that we have protected those. I don't know that it's necessarily environmental or is findings it? Some, could be something that you mentioned. Um, specifically. Uh, that you've addressed the 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 historic cultural and cultural, and historical. Yeah. yeah, cultural and historical. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Okay. Yep. Anything else there? All right. Um, the third finding that we need to make, the zoning bylaw section 210-223 special permits applies to all special permits and includes the statutory findings required in Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 9. A special permit may only be granted if the board determines that all applicable criteria and standards set forth in this chapter, i.e. the zoning bylaw, have been satisfied, which we just talked about. Um, and grant of the special permit will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of this chapter, which is the zoning bylaw. Um, and whether we like it or not, I think that we agree that it does satisfy the zoning bylaw. The board must, um, okay. Yes. Anybody so, have anything else to add? So, yes. What you want to do is to vote each vote, one of them. Well, you can do them all as a group, but you should vote the findings before you, and then take a separate vote to on, on okay. the um, actual special permit. Still individual. So, uh, so it's only the two, right? No, the findings. The two what? Number two. The. Oh, number, number two. two. Um, but, but in this list. Be, um, oh. No, we don't need to issue a finding on the first of the recommended findings in the minutes because they now conform to the buffer requirements. So there's no finding. Right. That's correct. So we need to vote on Section number special eight. permit findings. Special permit findings. findings. Two A three. Oh, thank you. Um, and you need to do it all at once. Individually. Individually. 
All right, the special permit findings. Um, I am missing my first Has anybody page. seen this online? Oh, is there a page? Oh, sorry. This is the problem with doing it on paper. Um, I have so it's in the public hearing outline. I don't know. I think it was the very top. I can find yeah. it. It's you look at the hearing it's outline. So public hearing outline. Thank you. Nine and nine okay, I got, I got that. Public sorry, hearing sorry, outline. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yep, page is nine, it, right? Is it page nine? Um. Oh, thank you. A through E. Okay. All right, I'm going to need to use staples next time. My apologies to the gathered crowd here. Um, the special permit findings, section 210-203-D and 210-223, describe in detail the reasoning behind each finding. So A, the commercial solar photovoltaic installa installation conforms to the pro provisions of this article of the zoning bylaw, commercial solar photovoltaic installations. So specifically describe in detail but behind e the reasoning behind each finding. You've done that. I think yeah. that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Those All right, and and, and, and the commercial solar vo vo photovoltaic installation will not be detrimental. So, yes, we did that. Yeah. Is that yeah. what I'm That's supposed to be doing now? Just went through. To vote yeah. now you need you to need vote. vote. You just need to call for a vote, either on. A through E as a group or A through Thank E. Thank you. All right. As a little. So I will uh, entertain a motion to um, approve that we have, to agree that we have uh, found, help me with the language. I move. Yes. That we find that the five criteria A through E listed on the public hearing outline, public hearing outline have been satisfied. Have been satisfied. Okay. Somebody want to make that motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Is this our this final end all vote? This is the finding. No, this is not. This is the finding. Just the finding. Then we have to vote the special permit itself with the conditions. Fran and Deb. I made the motion. She seconded. What is that? What? Just want to know who seconded the motion. Oh. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying. I, was, I had one question. Sure. On the findings, I apologize. Um, for the for B. When you talk about um, solar photovoltaic installation, you're, you're talking about the process of installation or the facility the itself? Facility no, installation, the facility, the facility, the facility itself. itself. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed signify by saying nay. Nay. And any abstentions? Okay, and now the special permit with the conditions as we detail. Mm -hmm. right. I will entertain a motion to um, approve the special permit with the conditions as outlined. I move, so move. Is there a second? Second. Um, is there discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Well, let me just say for the record, when I die, I want to come back as Dave Paul. Why is that? Because I got to, you got to vote no. Um, okay. Um, thank you all for that really good work. Um, It, um, Can I move to adjourn? No, we have to close the public hearing. We already did, we already did that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Tonight. Yeah, and the conditions, right? Yeah, and we yeah, we'll bring it to the next meeting. Yeah, that would be great. All right. Make a motion to adjourn. No, no. Is there a second? Do we have second. Can we do that? Oh, no. Can we? Kobe. What? Oh. Uh, uh.
uh, Form K for Legacy Farms. It just releases the small piece that is used under the ANR last time. Okay, I move to some signatures for that ANR. As you leave, you can. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay, so. So the last meeting, you endorsed an A&R plan that moved a little piece of um, the age-restricted development from one phase into another, and this would release that from the uh, subdivision covenant. So it's as simple as that. Yes. All right. I'll entertain a motion to approve that signing of that form. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Um, we'll do the minutes the next time. I'll have to entertain a motion, motion to, adjourn. to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Wow.